Okay. How's everybody doing? Um, yay. Well, welcome everyone. I'm, um, I'm really, really excited to launch this event today. Uh, has been in the making for, I don't know, forever it seems. Uh, so it's really exciting to be able to share this with all of you, uh, both the students, which as you know, are a central part of our experience here in the making of our making and questioning and troubling of our curriculum, hopefully in the best way. Um, but also with our colleagues that are some online, some in person, and with all of you, the guests that are coming, which we're truly excited to uh, hear your uh, presentation. Um, I also, you know, this is uh, maybe a little bit to, so those of you who know me, you see, I get a little sentimental on these things. <laughs> So it is, um, how can I say, uh, it really touches me the idea that like after a, two years of the program, this is maybe the second event that we're able to do in person, all together in a room with some of you online, but still this feels like coming together and sort of having a conversation. And so it, I'm really, really excited to, like I said, share this with all of you um, in the... <laughs> I would like to call it aftermath of the pandemic, but it's really like an ongoing negotiation with the pandemic. Um, but before launching the event, I would like to thank all the people that, um, colleagues and uh, friends that helped making this uh, event possible. Um, from uh, Associate Dean Julia Cerniak and Dean Speaks from Main Campus, which have been a huge supporter uh, in the making and the coordinating of this event um, uh, in the last maybe four semester that, as you know, have been quite tricky. Um, but then also Claudia Delli and Jennifer Hag from Syracuse Abroad and Syracuse Florence uh, from a logistical and coordination aspect, um, as well as Kevin Burnett, which without whom the, the, this hybrid remote in-person recording setup would, would have not been possible. Um, and then of course, I do wanna give a very special thank to Irene Peano, which uh, her incredible contribution, uh, both in informal chats, informal uh, exchanges, but also with her seminar from the fall semester, which was, as you know, titled, The Rise and Fall of Rural, Rural Urbanism in Modern Italy, has been an incredible source of inspiration for the shaping uh, of the pedagogical model of our program in the last um, two semesters. Uh, so as some of you may know, um, uh, last year we have celebrated the 40 year anniversary of our architecture program here in Florence. Um, this is uh, sort of a satellite of a school that is um, located in upstate New York. Um, and for 40 years, we have had this sort of um, a broad satellite in a sense. Uh, and this sort of moment of reflection has been like really instrumental to, to start thinking about how as an American institution abroad here in Italy, in the context of Italy, we can begin to understand and perhaps hope to sort of rethink our pedagogies in the 21st century. Um, to perhaps, and this is something we've talked with the students a lot uh, in the last few semesters, to be aware of the sort of long tradition of grand tourists uh, that we inevitably 
partake in um, and uh, to try to sort of uh, with our program, with our uh, classes, with our uh, field studies uh, to articulate a mode of engagement with this context um, uh, or how to be out in the field uh, as architects, as designers, as art researchers, something that we did and we have spoke a lot about in the last few semesters. Um, in a way that sort of aims to move beyond uh, pra extractive practices uh, uh, as individual, as a community, but also as an institution. Um, and so from this perspective, uh, this symposium that, like I said, I'm really excited to have with all of you today, um, can perhaps be understood as the culminating event of this year-long uh, research, which <laughs> with a little bit of a hindsight, I was totally naive in thinking it was a, a year long research on the Bonifica in Italy. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, really this sort of uh, investigation on the infrastructural and social ecological space of the Bonifica in Italy. Um, our hope uh, as an architecture program, as an architecture school, was to think about ways to infuse um, notions of Italian canon with context, which is perhaps um, part of our heritage, our, um, our um, tradition as a, as a program, um, and sort of uh, to aim uh, to challenge the idea of the hermetically sealed architectural object, uh, to widen our attention from buildings as isolated objects to territories. Uh, throughout the year, uh, with the help of uh, many colleagues, with Cecilia, with Olivia, with Luca, uh, we have articulated a design brief, as well as specific field studies activities uh, that focus on the study of ecosystems and stress the importance of keeping human, more than human, and mechanical content, um, components within the same frame of analysis. And again, more of an informal tone, as you can imagine, this <laughs> has not come without any friction from uh, students, colleagues. Um, I wanted to put in like a small kind of um, anecdote of how the first group of students that we had last year in the middle of the Maremma Bonifica field had a little bit of a mutiny and said like, why are we here as architecture students? <laughs> so uh, being here today with all of you um, and with a, another group of students that has endured and really, I think, made the most of, of this uh, setup is really, um, from my perspective, a great accomplishment. Um, and so today I'm really thrilled to be able to welcome all our guests uh, to reflect on the interventions of Bonifica that took shape in Italy and um, including its sort of colonial possessions since uh, the end of the 18th century. Um, and hopefully uh, to, as a group, uh, to develop a conversation on how we can speculate on possible alternative futures, um, to think about how we can position ourselves as researchers, as designers, um, within the spatial, symbolic, affective, and material dimension of the context uh, that we continue to engage with at every scale. And so today, um, I mean, Irene is gonna go a little bit uh, more into the introduction of the individual speakers, but I wanted to sort of uh, highlight mostly the, the overall schedule for the day. Um, we're gonna have, um, uh, the, the way that we organized it was really to think of this not as a one-way content being thrown at you, but rather a series of uh, moments that can be instrumentalized for informal conversations. So we're going to have a set of two, com two presentations and then a small break, uh, which we can have in the room, in the garden outside, where hopefully more informal ways of talking to each other can occur. And then finally, in the end, um, we're gonna have a little bit of a response from Irene and then finally a round table where I'm hoping to really um, generate a conversation with all of you, the students, the guests and anyone online as well. Great, so without taking further time, I wanna uh, uh, ask Irene to come on the, on the stage and thank you all uh, for coming. Right. Um, thanks a lot, Daniela. It's my turn to really appreciate, um, well, first of all, the opportunity 
I was given to think through my latest uh, research interests uh, together with uh, students and uh, colleagues here at the School of Architecture in Florence. Um, it was obviously a challenge. I, uh, I should perhaps introduce myself a little bit. I trained as a social anthropologist um, and well, I, you know, I really engage in transdisciplinary kind of uh, research that has to do with migration. And uh, over the course of the years, um, in kind of disengagement with migrant workers in, in Italy, especially, and especially uh, with farm laborers who are living in more or less formal or informal settlements that are, you know, kind of range between camps and slums. And, you know, these are the people who sort of pick the fruits and vegetables that um, are found in shops and supermarkets across the country. Europe and the world, um, and who live in very dire conditions. But what uh, became increasingly clear for me, and I think this is something that we really share with uh, most of those who are going to present the research today, is the awareness of how, uh, in some sense, the, the current condition of migrant farm workers um, bears the traces of a history that uh, we can say began, well, at least at the end of the 18th century, that is when kind of the transformation of agriculture and of political life or, or political, uh, sort of political setup of the country um, kind of determined this shift towards ever more extractive and intensive ways to um, farm the lands. Um, and so uh, the spatial dimension of this is something that uh, was strikingly sort of prominent in, uh, in what I was looking at. Um, and so not only uh, the places where people live, but more generally the built environments kind of bore the traces of these violent histories of dispossession an extraction that I thought were very important to bring to light in order to better understand also our present. Um, and so this is how I came to research bonifica, I mean land reclamation, and broader projects that are also settler colonial projects. Again, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about this because I think um, our speakers today will do that if much best, better than, than I can do. Um, so, uh, well, thanks again uh, for being here today. I will just briefly introduce the speakers in the order in which uh, they are going to talk today. So our first speaker is uh, Andrea Bagnato, um, who researches architecture, ecology, and epidemiology since 2013. Um, his long-term project is called Terra Infecta, and I think there is a website where you can have a look at, at some of its outputs and uh, work in progress. Um, and among the outcomes of this project is a book on infected landscapes in Mediterranean Italy, forthcoming, uh, as well as lectures and an essay series. Again, I think most of this material is on the website, right? Um, so he recently curated together with Ivan Lopez uh, Munuera, a project called Vulnerable Beings that comprised two public assemblies at the Lisbon Museum of Art and Architecture, I think. Um, and there is an upcoming exhibition also that you're curating at La Casa Encendida in Madrid. Um, and uh, just one last uh, reference for you. Uh, he co-curated uh, a book uh, called A Moving Border, Alpine Cartographies of Climate Change that I found seriously fascinating. Um, and so that's Andrea. Uh, the second speaker, Roberta Biasillo, 
uh, is currently an assistant professor in contemporary political history in the Department uh, of History and Art History at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. <clears throat> she um, previously worked in Florence, uh, actually, but before that she earned a PhD in modern European history at the University of Bari, uh, and then worked across Europe uh, um, at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, um, at the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society in Munich, and uh, as I was saying, at the European University Institutes here in Florence. Roberta's interests uh, lie at the confluence of environmental history and political history. She is focused on marginal environments such as forests and wetlands embedded in Italian 19th century liberalism and on the role of African colonial um, environments in shaping Italian fascist state and empire. Roberta has recently submitted the monograph forthcoming um, that reconstructs the history of the Pontine marshes between the 1870s and the 1920s from uh, the point of view of environmental microhistory. And she also co-authored a book called Mussolini's Nature, an environmental history of fascism forthcoming this year with MIT Press. Um, and she currently works on a research project on the global environmental history of colonial Libya. That's Roberta. Uh, next in line is Emilio Distretti, a researcher, writer and educator who lives in London and currently is a postdoctoral fellow at the Urban Studies um, Centre of the University of Basel in Switzerland. Emilio studied philosophy at the University of Bologna and has a PhD in aesthetics and the politics of representation from the School of Art and Design at Portsmouth University in the UK. And before working in Basel, he was a postdoctoral fellow um, in East Jerusalem and the director of urban studies and spatial practices program um, at Bard College um, in Palestine. No. <laughs> um, Emilio's uh, research takes on interrelated avenues on the politics of space, architectural heritage, Italian fascist colonialism, post colonial and decolonial politics in the Mediterranean, that is Italy, North Africa, and the Levant, and in the Horn of Africa. He also taught uh, at the Metropolitan University and the uh, Source uh, University in London, and he collaborates with a collective, I think, called DAR, Decolonizing Architecture Arts Research. That's Emilio. And finally, last but not least, is uh, Elena Miltiadis, uh, who is currently an honorary research fellow at Durham University uh, in the UK. She recently completed uh, a PhD in anthropology uh, at the University of Durham itself, uh, which explored the emotional afterlife of an Italian city called Latina that I'm sure many of you have heard about, built by the fascist regime in 1932. Elena is interested in the ways contested pasts permeate the life of communities who elaborate, negotiate, and give meaning to their existence through, against, and beyond their contested identities. So very excited to also have this more anthropological perspective on the Budifica here today. Welcome you all. Thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this symposium. Um, it's really an honor, and I am sure this is going to be a very productive and engaging conversation. And of course, uh, that's, that should be with the help of everybody. So please feel free to ask questions during the Q&A. Thank you so much. And without further ado, I will leave the floor to our first speaker, Andrea Bagnato, who, whose presentation is titled The Colonial Continuum of land reclamation. Welcome you all, thank you so much. Uh, 
essere qua sotto. Vediamo. Ah no, tu hai il PDF, sì, vero? Il Keynote. Ah, Keynote, ok. Okay, thank you Irene and thank you Daniele for inviting me uh, and for having me here. Uh, I'm really happy to be here because it's an occasion, uh, well, to be in conversation with an amazing uh, group of scholars, but also because um, I, it was also a chance for me to present some of the research that I've done in the last uh, one and a half years, more or less. Uh, which I've not yet really presented very much, uh, also because, of course, of the, of the circumstances that we all went through. Um, so let's say this is very much a work in progress. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not a finished body of research, and also was not, let's say, undertaken completely within the, the boundaries of academia. I, I don't have a, um, a proper kind of research position in an institution, so, so my research is always um, uh, taking place, assembling, let's say, bits of funding and time as they become available. Um, so there will be a lot of questions and then perhaps not that many answers yet. But uh, I slightly changed my title as, as you may, uh, no, I don't know, you, I, I don't think you can see it actually, but it says land reclamation as planetary change, the long and the short. So really, for me, the idea is to try to think, uh, not to take a long view of land, land reclamation. Um, I'm interested in going beyond the kind of usual uh, temporality of bonifica, uh, the kind of immediate association and the kind of most visible manifestation of bonifica was, of course, during Italian fascism. But of course, uh, it's a process that begins uh, much before Italian fascism. And so I'm interested in thinking this, this process like, in the very kind of long durée of it. So, so from the kind of first modern iterations in the 16th century, all the way through its contemporary effects today and the consequences and the legacies of it. Uh, so I think we have this really interesting condition today in which Bonifica is something that most people, at least in Italy, don't really think about anymore. They don't even know about anymore. I'm talking about, let's say, uh, kind of uh, public or let's say the, the public discourse, right? I, I don't think that Bonifica is really something that is discussed at all or even remembered, except for in the areas where land reclamation took place on a large scale in the recent past, where I think there are interesting forms of memorialization that I think other scholars are more qualified than me to discuss. But otherwise, it's something that is kind of past, right? It's taken for granted. It's, it's not even kind of, it's, it's one of the many things, one of the many processes of modernity that we do not, that most people do not even uh, realize that is happened. You see the fields uh, and, and you see them as fields. You don't see them as what they, might have been, or like their ghosts, their, their, the presence of something that, that was there before. Um, and what was there before disappeared and disappeared in a very violent ways, right? So I'm also interested in, in, in presenting Bonifica as a violent process. Uh, I think Bonifica was an extremely violent process and was a, a violent process in a number of different ways. So I propose a sort of model to think about the violence of Bonifica. Um, which is, let's say, a model that I would like to kind of invite you to kind of keep in mind as I go through the, let's say, case study or, or the more kind of detailed uh, stories that I'm going to talk about. Uh, but because you will see that, like, I, I try to kind of locate this kind of four axes of violence that will kind of come back uh, continuously throughout the, the various events that I, that I will briefly present. And they kind of intersect uh, with each other and they, they cause each other, it's hard to disentangle them. Um, and the first one is, is uh, violence that concerns labor. So the exploitation of bodies, the exploitation of people. And I think it's interesting to, to think of a parallel between, of course, the contemporary uh, migrant workers that are exploited in the um, reclaimed landscapes that, of course, Irene has studied uh, extensively, and the workers that undertook the actual bonifica. Bonifica was done mostly by hand. Of course, you had in 
after 1850, I did rover and water pumps, but water pumps only did a small part of the work. I literally just lifted the water in, in one point at the end. But all the other work was done by hand by thousands of, of landless peasants that were usually uh, exploited uh, and worked. Uh, they worked in exactly the same conditions as today's peasants. They were hired by the day by a caporale that was a gangmaster that would just you know pick the, the most feet as, as, as the work required. They were extremely uh, underpaid and of course they, they would be made to live in, in temporary accommodation. They would suffer from malaria because they didn't have any immunity. Um, so I think this kind of violence on the bodies and through the bodies of workers that has never kind of really left the landscape of Bonifica. It's not, it's not a new phenomenon in that sense. Environmental violence, of course the environmental violence of, of wetlands is appearing. So wetlands is appearing have all sorts of uh, uh, consequences on a, on a kind of biological and ecological level that it's almost even impossible to, I think, completely understand, right? You have, it, it, they go from the, the loss of biodiversity uh, to uh, the, the carbon that is stored in the organic soils and then essentially gets released in the atmosphere, right? As you, as you expose the, the organic soils, they dry up. And so the carbon that is slowly stored, it just contributes to global climate change, right? Um, and of course, local effects that I will also go and, and, and briefly uh, touch. So when a landscape shifts from, from wet or from amphibious to dry, of course, the local uh, weather uh, is affected, right? It might become drier, it might become uh, hotter in summer and colder in winter. Social violence is, a, is the third, let's say, axis. And social violence uh, refers to the violence that was done to forms of property and forms of uh, ownership of the landscape that were, had long been established. And in Italian, they were known as beni comuni. Um, they would take like different kind of configurations, but essentially, I think it's, it's, it's important to keep in mind that most of the wetlands that were drained in Italy used to be managed and as common lands. So they, would not, they were not private. Uh, they did not belong to uh, one person, but they were managed by the village or, or community or group of villages. And there were lands where people could go and fish, hunt, um, harvest, according to systems that were not written, but that were, had been kind of developed over centuries and centuries, right? And so to drain the land means to do away with a common system of, of, of using the land in favor of a private system. I mean, the, the main incentive for, for land drainage was that the people who would invest, the landowners would invest in the bonifica and would become owners of the land. So you would literally create agricultural land out of nothing, or of course they, they, they called it nothing, right? And then the last is kind of geopolitical violence, or we could call it colonial violence proper. And, and this, is, this refers to, let's say, the, the way that fascism in particular, but even the liberal government of Italy before Mussolini would use Bonifica to make a point about the nation, to build the nation, right? So Bonifica as an act of, of nation making and remaking the nation. This, of course, with fascism, these, these, um, um, these, uh, these relationships become very, very obvious. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about two case studies. I'm sorry that actually is not, that's, this is just uh, one part of it. Uh, it's not very readable. Uh, and I thought I would juxtapose two case studies and I, I'll try to stay within the allocated time and it should be possible uh, because I think it's important and maybe I have Emilio to thank because he, in a previous conversation, he helped me like think better in terms of temporalities and the temporality of Bonifica, the temporality of climate change. So that's why I choose two different sites. The first one is the Lake Fucino in central Italy. And it refers to a very short period of time. So we, we are going to, to be thinking about a very short temporality. Uh, all of these changes happening within a matter of decades, right? The other part is the Pianura Veneta. So around the Venetian Lagoon, close to Venice. Whereby, where Bonifica actually developed over more than 500 years. So an extremely long, so a matter of centuries, right? From decades to centuries. And I'm interested in thinking this continuum of violence and these ways of changing the climate, Bonifica is climate change, Bonifica is planetary change in the very short and in the very long. So Lake Fucino is a lake that doesn't exist anymore. It's a ghost lake. Um, you can see in the middle of the, of the image uh, a spot, a uh, bright spot. That is uh, today's the Fucino Plain. is a 
very large uh, agricultural valley in the very middle of Italy. It's one of probably closest to the kind of geographical center of the peninsula. So you have Rome there, right? So it's about 150, I think, uh, 200 kilometers east of Rome. Um, so you have to imagine that the Lake Fucino was uh, exactly the same shape that you see today. The, the plane now is so big that, that you see it from space, right? Um, the lake was the third lake in Italy, I think, by, by dimension. Uh, it was kind of close to the dimension of Lake Garden, Lake Maggiore. So we're not talking about a small lake, we're talking about a major lake. And uh, this lake was completely drained between 1854 and 1872. So within the span of 20 years, the lake disappeared. Um, this is a, a drawing. All, all that we have left are you know, the uh, drawings and paintings of uh, Lago Fucino, that Fucino, sorry. Um, and uh, the town of Avezzano that today is the town that, that is by the, by the agricultural plain was a town by the lake. The Romans had built a, so this is a closed lake, right? It has no emissaries, no rivers that, that drain its waters. And so it would have like pretty substantial shifts in its, in its level, right, over time. And so the Romans had built an um, underground canal that is uh, at the bottom of the, of the cross section here, the mountains, so it's surrounded by mountains, right? So they, 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 they built, the ancient Romans built this canal in order to kind of try and control the level of the lake a little better. Then after that, so somehow like no one really kind of saw the lake as a problem anymore until, um, and this, sorry, this is the same place today. So it's more or less the same view. So it's a huge mosaic of, of, um, of uh, extend, extensive agriculture. So no one saw it as a problem until the mid 1850s when a nobleman called uh, Alessandro Torlonia, who was a, a Roman aristocrat, decided that he would try his hand at draining the lake. Why? Why would he, why would he drain the lake? Because of course he saw the business that was there to be made, right? He, he, by draining the lake, he would be able to become the owner of the entire lands that would, be, that would emerge from the lake. So I think for me, this project is so incredibly stunning because it's almost the kind of epitome of the, the hubris, the absurdity of Bonifica, like a single man that decides to drain an entire lake, one of Italy's largest lakes, in order to, to, to become owner of the lands. It's almost like a caricature of capitalism, right? And I think what's interesting is all of this happens before the kind of official legislative um, recognition of Bonifica within the Italian, uh, let's say, state. So it was completely a sort of private enter enterprise, right? Uh, and, but somehow I think it became the blueprint for then the institutionalization of, of Bonifica in the end of the, of the 19th century. So this is a, just a, one of the many plans of the, of the drainage of the lake. I'm not going to go into the details of the process. I mean, I think it's really an incredible story, but uh, it's something that I want to do more research on. So I'm just really started to look into it. Uh, so I'll just give you like a couple of um, a couple of pointers, but uh, but just be aware. Let's say that indeed it's uh, it's a story that would serve a, a conference on its own, I believe. So Torlonia called uh, the best. Water engineers of the of the period to try and and there were French and Italian and English so it was a massive pro project uh, that, that that entailed the the work of, of dozens of, of engineers to try and, and drain the lake and at the beginning they, they thought that they would at least leave a smaller part which is the kind of smaller kind of lake there as a sort of uh, you know remaining little lake but then even that was drained because at some point Orlonia became so greedy that he not even that right could 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 remain i wanted you wanted it all and i think what is really important also is like the process like we in, in the story you see the actual process of delimitation taking place now so the lake of course you couldn't quite so easily determine where the lake ended because it would be subject to to changes in tides but uh, torlonia so went when they were uh, at the highest possible tide and set a series of 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 chipio of boundary markers in the basically all around the lake with a statue of the Virgin Mary on top of it. And all those markers are still there if you go there. And so he tried again, like using the, the highest tide to get the biggest possible, the biggest possible um, area, right? 
and he invested all of his money into it. And at some point it seemed like he was about to fail, but then somehow he managed. And, and he managed and he was made into a prince by the, by the Italian state. So he was a small nobleman that became a prince. And he went on, the, the, the money that he made from the operation was so big that he became one of the richest men in Rome. He set up a bank that was called Banca del Fucino, and he became almost the unofficial uh, banker of the, of the Vatican. And later, extremely close to Mussolini. So like, even if you start to trace the history of this one family and of, of the capital that is literally kind of generated from this land reclamation, you kind of see like an extremely long, like kind of a slice of, of, of uh, 20th century Italy. So. This is uh, some of the appearance of the um, of the of the plane today. You know, it's a kind of uh, extremely dramatic landscape because you're completely surrounded by mountains. It's it's also absolutely unreal. It's one of the coldest places in Italy in the winter, even though it's so south because it's it's extremely dry, right? And this is the Palazzo Torlonia, so the the palace that uh, Torlonia was able to purchase after the drainage. It's just in Via della Conciliazione, so next to the Vatican. So really, I think this is a kind of built uh, materialization of of bonifica as primitive accumulation, right? So, and I think it's really really important to for me to go back to this to this concept, right? The classic kind of Marxist concept of primitive accumulation. So capital that is literally conjured out of thin air and of course it's not thin air it's the it's the sweat and blood of the workers and the also the life the the biological life that disappeared with the, with the lake right so the 1872, the lake is completely dry. It's, it's turned into an agricultural landscape. And then in 1915, a major earthquake shakes the region with 30,000 people die. Just next to, just next to it, uh, around Avezzano. And this is an incredible event. It's, it's, it's absurd, it's unfathomable. And, and I'm, I've been starting to look into the research to understand whether there, there, there was a connection. And uh, some, some scientists are, and I, I need to like look better into this, but some scientists are positing you need a connection between essentially the, the removal of such a mass of water and the, the kind of geological instability that derived from it. Uh, it's very difficult. It's a causality that is very difficult to prove, but I think it kind of shows it hints at the scale that, that Bonifica or the, the, uh, of the effects of Bonifica, right? The, really the planetary scale, if a, a earthquake can, can be generated through the land reclamation, right? And then after that, it's a um, period of massive labor exploitation, massive agricultural exploitation, because Torlonia was a, a latifundia, was a large owner of the entire plain. So he, all of the peasants were working for him. And the, the kind of exploitation of the peasants was, was very dramatic. And it was famously memorialized by Ignazio Silone in his novel Fontamara that was published in exile in 1933. Ignazio Silone was a communist writer. He, was he, he, he had to run away from fascism and, in Paris, and he was able to, to, to write this book in which he really kind of tells the story of the peasants of the Fucino from, from their own perspective, right? And this is the kind of incredible um, story that the peasants uh, tell to each other um, about uh, the power of Torlonia. At the head of everything is God, the Lord of heaven. Everyone knows that. Then comes Prince Torlonia, Lord of the earth. Then come Prince Torlonia's guards. Then come Prince Torlonia's guards dogs. Then nothing at all. Then nothing at all. Then nothing at all. Then come the Cafoni, the peasants. And that's all. And the kind of violence against the, the peasants kind of goes on until the, even after the war, right? Uh, as the peasants start to reorganize again and, and to protest, and there is a, a echidio, so the, the killing and where the, the carabinieri are shooting on the crowds of peasants that are asking for better conditions, right? And then with the reform agraria, so the land reformation in the 1960s, finally the, the latifond of Torlonia will be broken down into small owners, but this doesn't mean that the exploitation ends because in fact, uh, just in uh, November last year, uh, the, the police discovered uh, uh, massive episodes of caporalato. So again, of exploitations of the current workers in the Fucino. So again, it's something that doesn't seem to be, this violence doesn't seem to be able to leave the, the kind of uh, ghost of the lake, right? And so in terms of the consequences of the climate consequences now, um, it's really, I think this is really like a, the big open question for me. How do you chart, how do you understand what does Bonifica do to climate? Um, I think there is a problem of sources, a problem of archives. 
how are you going, who, whose voices, whose do, what, which documents are you going to be reading? Um, on the one hand, there are the kind of immediate consequences that were very obvious to the people who were living there as the lake was being drained, uh, because around Fucino there were olive trees, uh, uh, wine, uh, wine plants, uh, wine cultivation, fruit trees. So it was a sort of a Mediterranean climate because the lake, of course, would, would really kind of create its own microclimate. And with the disappearance of the lake, the, the wines, uh, the, um, the vines, the olives and the fruit trees all disappeared. Uh, the summer started to become hotter and the winter started to become colder and so on. But these are all kind of unquantified changes, right? You can, you can kind of, no one uh, would record the, the voice of the, of the local people. So I think it's a problem also of epistemology. Uh, the Torlonia advocates were arguing that actually the changes had nothing to do with the land reclamation. So there was an immediately a conflict there, right? So much so that even the former landowners that would have the, the fruit trees would revolt against Torlonia. So you almost have a clash between two different forms of capitalism and the kind of previous capitalism of like small scale landowners and the new capitalism of Torlonia that is the largest state landholder. And then of course, there have been some, some retrospective models, some models, climate models that looked back at the possible effects, tried to model the effects of the disappearance of a lake, which of course found uh, very, very, again, powerful effects of the, which are easy to understand on an intuitive level, but how do we quantify them? And does it make sense to quantify them? Now, this is the um, other site that I'm going to be talking about, which is the Bassa Pianura Veneta, which is a, an area uh, that is just northeast of Venice. I'm going precisely to be looking at. So, between the northern lagoon and the other lagoon to the right, that is the Laguna of Grano. And these parts of Veneto was completely covered in wetlands and marshes of varied degrees of, of salinity until very recently. But as I was saying, it's a very long process. So the time span in this case is much longer. Um, we start very quickly with Giorgione, a classic uh, Renaissance Venetian painter who was one of the kind of first to look at the landscape. And, and in so many of Giorgione's paintings, we see water in the background, like there's always water in some kind of form. And I think this is this points to a sense of the Venetian landscape. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the landscape, not of, of Venice itself, which is in the middle of the lagoon, but of the mainland. The mainland being a landscape of water, of water that would take the form of small lakes, uh, ponds, marshes, all in a kind of very complex uh, mosaic, right? And so, the Giorgione paintings are interesting also for his timing because the 16th century is the moment in which the reach of Venice start to expand on the mainland. So the, the, the sea trade was no longer so profitable as it used to be. And so the, the wealthy, the, 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 the aristocratic families of Venice had to kind of move their business on the land, right? It was no longer a, a Venice was no longer a city that was mastering the seas because, of course, trade had moved to the Atlantic Ocean. So they move on the land, and what do they do? They build villas. And to build villas, they need to, and of course, the villa is an economic unit, right? It's not just a beautiful architecture. But to build villa, you have to reclaim the land. You have to, again, like the whole of Veneto was a humid and amphibious landscape, right? So the most obvious manifestation of this is Palladio. The, the villas of Palladio are villas that could be built only because of this early stage of bonifica. And someone called it la febbre di terra, the fever for land. So where all of the kind of wealthy Venetians try to undertake small land reclamation in little parts of the mainland in order to build their own villas and to cultivate and so on, and try to, try to uh, gain new lands that, that could be made profitable. So I think it's important again to, to keep in, in mind, you know, the ground on which Palladio's architecture was, was built. Um, this again is a painting of the, of the um, it's not by Giorgione of course, but, but just showing I think the garden of the traditional villa of, of, of uh, the let's say high Renaissance in, in, in Venice. And so 
in the mid uh, in 1566 the, the republic of uh, venezia of venice sets up the proveditores of avenin culti which is essentially a ministry that is charged with uh, privatizing starting to chart and to enclose the common lands so the lands that were humid and wet uh, the wetlands um, so there are these archives that are full of maps and charts of the, of the wetlands of veneto and and they they were used in order to, to start to understand how land reclamation could be possible. So again, we have a first phase of primitive accumulation here in the middle of the 16th century. Um, and uh, there is a famous kind of controversy at this time between uh, Alvise Corner, who was a uh, local land, uh, Venetian landowner, and the Magistrato Le Acque. So the Magistrato Le Acque is a very powerful public authority in Venice that is responsible for managing the lagoon. Of course, the lagoon is uh, Venice's uh, biggest asset, right? And so Corner was so much eager to drain parts of the land that at some point he was threatening the very equilibrium of the lagoons, right? Because he wanted to dig certain canals that would have likely kind of deposited a lot of silt into the lagoon. And this was likely, of course, to, to, to dry up parts of the lagoon. And so the Magistrato alle Acque stepped in and kind of blocked Alvise Corner. So this also points to the fact that while land reclamation were already taking place 500 years ago, there was also a sense of economic ba uh, ecological balance that had to be preserved, right? Of course, it was uh, not disinterested. It was Venice, uh, Venice authorities that had a very uh, in, strong interest in preserving the lagoon as it was, right? If you, if you drain the land too much, then the lagoon, they knew, somehow they knew already that the lagoon would be threatened, as indeed it is today. But then you can see a clash, right, between the capitalists who wanted just to reclaim the lands to make their, their fields and their villas and, the, and the, the city authorities. And then, let's say, in the following centuries, there starts to be an awareness of malaria as well. So the kind of big medical problem uh, of the wetlands uh, that I'm really not going to go into because that's part of the research I've done, but it's, it would be really too much. So I also would like quickly to then now take a step into the wetlands, right? And, and think of the wetlands as a landscape, because of course they're the typical kind of uh, argument of, of in favor of Bonifica was that the wetlands are dead, they are uh, ill, they're full of malaria, uh, the water is still, the water doesn't move, uh, it, it, it's dangerous. I mean, I think you perhaps all have heard all of the kind of possible tropes that surround the swamps, uh, drain the swamps, uh, that's it's still with us, right? Uh, sadly or, or, or not. But when you try to take a look at what the swamps were for the people who were living off the swamps, I think, of course, a different, a very different picture emerges. And it's very hard to know what the swamps were like, how people were living off of it, because no one cared about these people. Uh, the, the people who were living from the wetlands were not even peasants, right? They were considered, let's say, hunter gatherers. So, in a kind of hierarchy of modernity, they are kind of the lowest of the low. People who live off the nature, right? They don't even have to cultivate. And so, the kind of modern, let's say, hierarchy would, would kind of really relegate them to the very bottom. So, there are no records of their livelihoods, of their practices, except for kind of lucky bits that somehow have survived. So, I, I, I spoke extensively to an incredible anthropologist that you may know, that's called, who is called Nadia Breda. And she, went through all of the few remaining wetlands of Veneto that are really, really a few today to talk to the people who, were, who used to live in the wetlands, because of course, some of the wetlands survived until the 1960s. So it's something that is still within living memory, you know, so, so we go from the Renaissance to, let's say, living memory. And it, let's say she gives this beautiful uh, picture of the wetlands as a, a landscape that is very much alive, right? That is very complex, that has an incredible biodiversity. This is just the taxonomy of the, of the cane. Um, so it's just one uh, uh, plant species, right? That of course would have so many different uses. Uh, you could use it for making tools, for making baskets, for making uh, decorations, for making furniture. So it, it was an economy, right? Very much, uh, very active. But it was a localized economy, it was a situated economy that could not, not so easily be, be scaled up. 
And this is a beautiful diagram also that, that Nadia Breda kind of pieced up from the voices and the literal voices of, of the people uh, that were living from the wetlands in Veneto that shows how there was also a yearly cycle in the, in the, in the wetlands, right, in the marshes. The, the water was not still at all, the water would move and there was a moment in the year in which around the, the spring in which the water would kind of enter the marsh and then a moment of the year in which the water would exit. Uh, so, and they knew how to kind of manage all these different phases. Now there was a, a, its own seasonality that has nothing to do with the four seasons as we used to think of them. And this is something that we still find in the kind of current, the few remaining wetlands. I, I went to, to talk to, to a man who runs a fishery, uh, Valle da Pesca, in, in the Venetian Lagoon. And he tells, he had this beautiful conception of the water as something that you have to work, you know, as a material that you have to work to kind of maintain. He said, like quite literally, if you man don't maintain the water, the water rots. So there was a kind of set of practices that developed over centuries and centuries, right? To make a livelihood out of the, out of the um, marshes and to make the marshes into a live place, landscape. So this is one of the few images I think that we have of what the wetlands on Veneto used to be. And this is a card, uh, a Kriegs card is a map that, that was, um, put together by the uh, Austrian army in uh, the very first years of the eight, 19th century. It's a beautiful map because it's extremely detailed and it shows also the wetlands in different seasons. That's the colors uh, basically mirror the moment of the year in which the, the surveyor uh, was drawing that particular sheet. Each sheet was, was drawn by a different surveyor. And of course they would go in different times of the year because the map was done over five years. And so the, the, blue, uh, the blue one was probably in the moment when there was the most water. And then the yellow, uh, this kind of yellowish one represents a moment in which there was the least water. So you can see in the same, in the same spot, you can actually see uh, all the seasonalities of the wetlands, right? So again, something very different from, from the idea of the wetland that the, the people behind the Bonifica had. And again, like you have an, another moment in the 19th century, the 19th century of primitive accumulation of enclosure. So a process of enclosure that begins in the 16th century and continues in the 19th century. So it's one of the many, this is one of the many laws that were enacted around Italy to enclose the, Benin culti. So all the land that was deemed to be uncultivated. So again, you know, I, I don't need to go into this, I think, but uh, an idea that cultivation is the only, let's say modern agriculture is the only process that makes land valuable, that makes land, um, that makes land, uh, uh, let's say, definable, mappable, quantifiable, right? And everything else could be just enclosed, fenced off, and then drained. And I think this is, uh, so one of the few, this is a Valle da Pesca, the one where I, that I visited, and it's one of the few parts of the lagoon that, that still remain, right? And so while the entire region of Veneto has been essentially drained in different moments huh, between the, the 16th century and, and the 19th, and 20th century, a few parts remained. And the parts that remained are the parts that belong to the, to the aristocrats. So many of the Venetian aristocrats would have their own Valle da Pesca, right? So many wetlands were managed in common, but others were, would belong to particular uh, noblemen because of course they were rich. They were rich in resources in fish and, and, and birds. And of course the aristocrats were not stupid. They knew this very well. And so the only parts that actually have survived are the, the, the Valle da Pesca that remain private, right? So, so this, in, this whole, part of the lagoon is private and there's been like ongoing controversies even today as to whether you can really privatize or not a part of the Venetian lagoon and of course the the owners argue that yes you can and the state argues that you cannot um, but you see basically in the juxtaposition of the two parts of the map there uh, that all of the land around the lagoon proper has been completely, of course, uh, drained and made into agricultural land, whereas it used to be also like uh, marshes. Um, very quickly now, because I'm already like running out of time, but uh, I want to really just suggest the 
process by which in the 19th century through the um, let's say as bonifica starts to become a modern process so with the invention of the hydrovora of the of the water pump that is powered by steam around 1850 uh, land reclamation takes up a whole different speed right so it used to be something that you would do by just filling up the water with with soil and it becomes something that you do through steam power right and steam power enables to lift to lift the water and so at the same time so in the, the second part of the 19th century you also have this kind of big push uh, this big kind of production of medical knowledge that basically was about medicalizing peasants right uh, and so making the peasants into into a sick part of the italian population um, this was very important i think this is part of the story because why because this was essentially the step before racializing the, the peasants, right? And racializing the peasants was necessary in order to exploit them and to exploit them in the reclamation works. This is a quote by Ariano Prosper in which he explains how dirt started to become weaponized uh, in order to, 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 to critique, uh, to censor the way of life of the, of the farmers of, of Italy. And so the farmers were... I think we need the sound actually. The farmers, were the, the peasants of Veneto were, were then forced to work as uh, scariolanti, so as actually, you know, like diggers. Uh, this is bonifica uh, taking place. And oftentimes the, the, the workers uh, that, that were doing this were workers that had been dispossessed by the enclosures. So they would the poorest peasants that didn't have their own lands would survive through the common lands, right? Because they were able to graze, to, to hunt, to fish in common lands. With the enclosures of common lands, all of a sudden people had, uh, peasants had no land and no common resources on which to live. And so they were employed in the Bonifica. So you see again, like how primitive accumulations generates uh, an army, like what perhaps Marx would call the reserve army of labor, right? That then gets kind of employed in the Bonifica. And in the Bonifica, they are essentially infected with malaria because they were not, they were often displaced across long distances and they would not have the, the immunity to malaria, right? So this is the kind of phase in which malaria really starts to become a, a, something to be mapped and um, and, uh, and, and resolved. So bonifica throughout the 20th century becomes more and more a medical problem as well, right? So, so the, the medical language, medical knowledge replaces, of course, the traditional knowledge of, of these landscapes and becomes the cover under which bonifica has to be done. People are dying of malaria, we have to drain the lands, we have to drain the swamps. And of course, the people who are dying of malaria were they displace people, eh? because again, people who were born in this area used to be immune from it. Um, so I'm just keeping quickly, but I just will do, will show you like a very quickly how the landscape has changed throughout, throughout this, like the speed to which it changes, uh, it's changed as well. This is just uh, close to Kaurle, so we are uh, about, um, well, where all these kind of lakes, can I, well, I cannot show it, but this kind of like, you can see these aquitrines, it's like water bodies, right? Northeast of Venice. This is a um, magnification of it. So the first map uh, by, by the Italian kind of cartographers, the state cartographers in 1891 still shows like a pretty massive, um, pretty massive uh, part of wetlands. And then in subsequent uh, iterations of the map, the, the wetlands start to shrink. So from 1924 to 1932, so within eight years, you lose like more than half. And then by 1954, it's all gone, right? It's all, it's all dry land. And this, of course, this is a, like a short zoom in that just mirrors, of course, or, or, or shows what happened in the entire uh, plain of Veneto. Um, and then in terms of the consequences of it, right? Very quickly, but uh, the first kind of most dramatic consequence was the alluvione, the flood, the massive flood in 1966. Uh, so all of the most of the of the drained wetlands are below sea level, and and this was done kind of so quickly, right? That um, there wasn't really any kind of uh, thinking or protection against what a rising sea might do. 
and and so as the this particular year it rained more than than usual and the, the river was the piave was full of water and and uh, it basically at some point the the banks of the river broke and and the entire territory was 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 flooded and this image i think really kind of perhaps symbolizes so these are the kind of Casa Colonica, so the colonial homes that were built in, uh, in the Bonifica near Musile di Piave. And they were all named with this kind of lexicon, right, of Bonifica, Vittoria, Redenta, Fertile, Carisorta. There are like about a dozen of these. And they were all abandoned in 1966 because the entire area was, was three meters below sea level and uh, it remained flooded for over a month. So after, after that, uh, the the kind of the, the, the houses were unusable. And so you can see like this kind of short-lived dream of, of redemption. And then of course, this is the other part of it, which is the, the projections for the future. Um, this is the, the same area, right? And uh, under the 8.5 scenario, which is of course the one of the worst case scenarios in climate modeling, but it's not that far off as well from, from where we are going, right? And basically the entire part of the, of the what that used to be covered by, by wetlands will return wet. So I think really that for me, maybe it's, uh, it's uh, I already went seven minutes over time. So I will just finish it here. No? Oh, you can go on my screen. Okay. Good afternoon, and I'm happy to. Okay, I'm happy to be here, and thank you, Daniele, and thank you, Irene, for your invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be back in Florence and to get to know you. Uh, yeah. So I. This is. I mean, I'm also happy to come after uh, Andrea because many concepts. I mean, we will work with the same concepts, and we will see them how they apply to other case studies. So my idea was to look uh, to the ideas and practices of Bonifica during the 18, uh, 20, uh, 19th and 20th century. So I will use both in colonial and uh, in domestic environment. So my idea is to yeah, just explain why uh, it's important to talk about reclamation when we uh, think about urban planning and rural planning, and then to deep dig, in, uh, dig into uh, the two cases and reflect on the idea uh, of reclamation uh, in Italy and how this idea changed over time. Yeah, so why, uh, why, it's in, why is this nexus between reclamation and uh, territorial planning? It's important. I mean, territorial is a word that is very tied with the Italian culture and the Italian uh, making of landscape, and also landscape and territory uh, are really connected to the Italian culture. So we don't use much environment, we use a lot of territory and landscape. So this is also an element that we may reflect uh, upon later. So there is a definition of territory given by geographers. So when we talk about the territory, we generally have an area that can have a different extent, but the, the main element is that there is a center where administrative decisions are taken. So you have a territorium and then you have one center that is the core of the political, it's the political center of this area. Then to have a territorium, you need to have uh, a physical space that is defined by uh, orographic or hydrological similar features. So it should be some kind of homogeneous, it should be an homogeneous uh, landscape. And then uh, the third element is that this area should be in connection with other areas. Uh, and we will see how this will apply. So we move from the definition of territory. And you see how Bonifica, even in, in the short term or in the long term, has affected a lot the transformation of the uh, Italian space. And Italy 
together with the Netherlands are probably the two countries in Europe that have developed a huge set of uh, policies and practices of transforming the nations through uh, reclamation projects. Uh, okay, so when you, if we think historically, when we look at uh, a space, the space can be made or unmade. So a territory can be done or undone. And reclamation projects are key processes in this making and unmaking of the uh, Italian uh, landscape, both rural and uh, urban. So generally, and this is something that I want to stress a lot, when we have an environmental transformation, we also have a political transformation and a social transformation because the reclamation is not only uh, a pure ecological uh, change of the of the space, but there are many other aspects that are connected, as we have already seen. So, uh, when reclamation re when reclamation is so strong and so severe, we can have the dissolution of an old territory and the creation of a new territorial entity. And this is probably the case uh, that one case that we are going to look into today. So, yeah, just try to think at Bonifica as a tool to change radically or less radically the space uh, in Italy. Uh, when I was thinking if what we can consider reclamation and what, what kind of environmental transformations are not reclamation projects, I started from two definitions that we have uh, uh, in, uh, in scholarship in Italy, in, uh, produced in Italy about, re about reclamation. So, the first is by Piero Bevilacqua and Manlio Rossidoria, and this definition comes from uh, history. Uh, the second one is by Stefano Piastra, and Stefano Piastra is a geographer. So both history and geography generally uh, go together when we discuss reclamation projects. So in the first uh, definition, we have uh, that reclamation is a recurring response that pre-industrial society have enacted. And what is the context of uh, this uh, of the reclamation is that we have uh, we are in a, uh, in a conservative uh, context. So human and the animal, animal workforce remain the same. And also the productivity of a place uh, is boosted, but without, um, without a transformation of technological and scientific tools. So this is the, uh, uh, the, um, the definition of reclamation given by Piero Bevilacqua, that is one of the most historians of uh, agriculture and uh, landscape in Italy. So we have some actions that are like everyday action, and we don't change too much. The, um, we, we don't create a new territory. So we are within certain constraints and we transform the landscape according to uh, uh, enacting like recurring strategies, but those don't need to transform completely uh, the, the area. So this is the first definition. And then the second definition that is um, given by the, this geographer is that reclamation is a space for debate about territorial management. When you have a single idea of how to transform a landscape, can we talk about bonifica? I think this is, uh, we can discuss about that. But I moved from those two definitions that are given by very like eminent scholars in the field of reclamation in Italy. And I started looking at two cases of, uh, of reclamation in Italy and in Libya. Uh, reclamations has been enacted very differently. And also I, uh, when I started researching on that, I came up with like four main questions that can like define uh, what uh, uh, the, the, any reclamation project. By when is important because reclamation concepts change it over time. So when we look at reclamation in the 16th century is different from reclamation in the 19th century. And again, reclamation in the 20th century became uh, completely another, an, another uh, idea of landscape transformation. So the first thing to look is when. Then who is proposing or is um, doing the reclamation and for whom? So we saw that uh, private uh, owners were very much interested in uh, in extending uh, land uh, land uh, and fields for, for productivity purposes. But were there other ideas of uh, reclamation? So, who were the social actors that uh, create different ideas and projects of reclamation? 
Then technology, politics, and economics are generally connected. And technology is an, an essential uh, tool, as we have already discussed. So when uh, uh, the uh, drainage was done with machines, everything changed. But in the but also before, I mean, we had animals, we had human beings. So technology is an essential component when we are to describe uh, also the overcoming of the ecological limits uh, of reclamation. And then reclamation uh, takes different shape according to the types of environment when uh, where the reclamation project is conducted. So in this picture, this is a very like common uh, area where, reclam where reclamation projects are conducted but this we will see these are this kind of environment are present in italy but in other places environments are different so i will use two case studies one is um is the pontine marshes and i use the micro history perspective this is a i i've already concluded this research so uh, i can go to a bit more in detail. So this is, I used the microhistory perspective to look what happened in a, in a municipality that was the main municipality of the Pontine Marshes. So this municipality extended over half of the, um, half, half of the ma marshes surface. Uh, and I looked at that in, uh, in this, straight before the fascist reclamation uh, uh, project. So, uh, and then the other one is in, uh, is. Libya during the uh, Italian rule. So the, it started, uh, the Italian rule started in 1912, but the reclamation project conducted by the state started in 1932. So those two environments are interesting because in a very compressed time period, we can see the complete transformation of the environment because those two were at the time where the reclamation project started very conservative environment. Um, so, uh, yeah, if I had to describe what happened in the Pontine, Pontine Marshes uh, between the 18th and 19th century, we can just look at the difference between this map and the other one. So, uh, also the level of details. So, generally, uh, our idea of, um, of, of marshes are very, like, confined to, like, water or uh, land flooded with water, but the uh, the Pontine Marshes was a very diverse environment. There were mountains, uh, coastal lakes, uh, rivers, still water. Uh, there was a huge plain in the middle, and then there was a made there was the largest plain forest um, uh, in Italy in the 19th century, and this remained very much the same because it was close to Rome, but it was. Uh, was not well connected to, to the city. So this, this is very interesting because what we seen in the north of Italy starting uh, 50 years before, this, uh, I mean, before the fascist regime, nothing compared to the reclamation of Veneto, or the Veneto region, for example, for example, occurred here. So, and this map was very detailed. So the area that was reclaimed in the um, 18th century was the center, the central part. And then there's still there's the the forest was a main asset of the area, but also mountains. Then if we look at this map, this was done always before the uh, fascist reclamation. But uh, if you think who who has who has done this map? This map was drawn by the consortium of private owners. So the plots that you see there were the main uh, the the owners of that plot were the main uh, uh, the, the the main the, the person who commissioned the uh, this map. So see the, the forest disappeared and the only uh, thing that is uh, is depicted in the map is the area that was uh, reclaimed. And the area reclaimed extend, um, enlarged over the liberal period in Italy before the fascist regime. So what is interesting about this, uh, the, the Pontine marshes is that there is a mixture of waters and land. There are different kinds of water. There were lakes, there were rivers, there was canals built. Uh, in the 18th century, and the in the um, in the definition of contemporaries, we don't have much difference between water and land. They use words that can uh, that are a mix of water and land. So the uh, there is really no definition. So and then this is also the period where there is a shift from the value of water to the value of land. Land became very important in the uh, in the late. Um, in the late 19th century 
and we will see then the actors, but before that water and those in the early modern period, water was much more valuable. Then uh, it was a territory of circular migration. So it was not empty. A lot of people used to go and live in the forest. And those, those groups were uh, almost, I mean, resident of the area. And they used to come from the mountains, but also from nearby regions. Then malaria was like the main, uh, was the main um, protagonist of this place, but there was also other diseases connected to uh, lack, of lack of vitamins, lack of proper uh, food, so, and also uh, very poor uh, hygienic conditions. So malaria was one of the many uh, illness presented uh, in the area. Then it was a vast non-urban area. The, uh, when uh, foreign people, when to visit the Pontine marshes, the first thing they notice is why this municipality, that is the municipality I worked on, is completely non-urban. So it was a huge countryside. Uh, water and lead were common. So until the 19th century, the, um, those, those municipality was given um, water and land uh, properties to, to attract uh, people because it was not very because this, this area was not very populated and attracting people was a strategy to reclaim the area and having those uh, assets in common was was a way to uh, improve and increase the productivity of the area uh, even the municipality was that was there that is Terracina is the uh, city I uh, looked into was yes was a city but was not urbanized so there was no uh, sewage uh, canals inside the city were really um, not similar to other uh, modern uh, water system and also the housing conditions were very poor even in the city center so really there was a continuum between this vast countryside and the center that was considered the city and then it's also interesting to see how map uh, represented how maps represented the area so how forest was very present until the 19th century and then the forest disappeared, it became just a white spot on the map. When I looked at this, um, at this area, I, I started thinking who were the actors conducted the Bonifica. Uh, and I selected the small municipality, the municipality, well, it was not small, it was one of the largest municipalities in Italy, but still it's a micro history of this uh, town. So Terracina had the large uh, countryside and uh, so the municipality and the um, uh, administrators uh, were my first actor. Then I was able to find um, an archival font with um, all the files, con uh, all the files about the uh, farmers, the collective of the farmer, and they created a collective agrarian agency. They, they were called Università. So universities at the time were uh, um, like collective of farmers without. Uh, without land, and they, uh, the idea was to use the common uh, in um, was the, to use the territory as a common. So we have administrator, we have farmers, and the third actors that appeared later was the hydraulic reclamation consortium. So it was the uh, consortium of private owners. So we have three different actors with three different uh, reclamation projects. So the idea of the marshland as a place where nothing happened was, was the way in which the Pontine marshes were represented when the fascist regime decided to transform completely the area. But there were already a lot of projects on how to reclaim the area. And straight before the fascist regime, the problem was that those three projects were really divergent. So each of these went in a different, uh, went in a different uh, direction. And then none of them was too strong to impose uh, its view on the other. So the first project was the one, uh, uh, the one um, conducted by the, the, the municipality, by the administrator. And the idea was, uh, as, uh, as Andrea said, there's here, this is the moment of the, uh, the, privatization, the privatization of the common. And if we look into the administrative part, we see that the, um, the administrators just took part of the territory or just avoid anything that can, um, that can test that the land the, the landscape was a huge common. So there, there was a lot of conflict. And the result of that is that due to maladministration, the territory 
became more and more privatized. So people uh, belonging to the uh, administration of this municipality took over a lot of uh, property, of, of course, the best properties, the more productive. Uh, but how I interpreted that, I called it this, this was a sort of metabolism of the commons because in uh, generally the, there, was a uh, there was a huge division between uh, the administration and the, uh, the countryside. So generally urban space and, and, the, and the countryside remained uh, detached from each other. People living there would never go to, to the city and people living in the city would have no idea what was happening in the marshland. But through this uh, like privatization, a lot of resources that were in the, in the countryside enter in the city center and modernize the city center. So this was the first project that was basically the idea of privatizing uh, the, the space in common without having a clear uh, idea of what was there. The second project is completely different from the idea that we have that reclamation coincides with privatization because this collective agency uh, express the voice, the voice of the farmers. What did the farmer want? The farmer, the farmer, in that time period, socialism was spreading all over the country. We are at the end of the uh, 19th century, and they, what, what they, they don't, uh, they didn't ask for uh, private, uh, private uh, farms or private fields. They just want to be sure to have access to the territory as common. So. But even in that case, there was this idea of reclaiming, but reclaiming a small area, the area that was closer to, closest to the city. But again, there was a, a, an attention to the diversity of the landscape, the use of the forest, the uh, reclamation of just a small part of the Fontaine marshes. And they never asked for a, a pri private field. And then at the end of the century, the consortium that was established earlier, but uh, came uh, in operation uh, at the end of the century, started to develop the, uh, what I call the aquaphobia. I mean, the, imagine a, 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 an area that was always flooded. And then at certain point, uh, a farm, uh, private owners started to complain about the recurring flooding the, of disa and disasters. Disasters were not a, was not a word that belonged to the, this area, but in the, 19, uh, in the yeah, 1988s, 1980s, this word started to appear uh, in relation to the Pontine marshes, and these recurring flood, flood, these recurring floods were interpreted as disasters. So uh, the yeah, the aquaphobia started to develop, and the idea of a completely drainage started to sparkle. But also in connection with the uh, modern science and technology that was becoming uh, available, and in this case, yes, reclamation coincided with uh, a privatization project. But at the very beginning, uh, until the fascist regime came, the reclamation was water reclamation, was hydraulic reclamation, was not land reclamation. And when the fascist, uh, when the fascist regime transformed the area, this was the uh, design. So it was completely uh, crossed by uh, canals, streets, uh, lakes were confined, uh, and then like new towns were were established. So there is a huge difference. So this is, and this is why studying uh, reclamation it's a tool. It is a tool to understand the changing of the planet. This was my first case. So we had different voices, and uh, also a specific. Well, the. The idea of bonifica is not the idea of a complete transformation. The complete transformation arrived only in 1928. So this was the time frame I started. Then if I move into, uh, into Libya, I mean, the environment is completely different. So if I compare, yeah, this was a wet environment and uh, the reclamation in Libya applied instead on an environment that was arid. So lack of water was the main uh, challenge that, the, that it, Italians, not only the fascist regime faced uh, in Libya. How this, uh, well, some of these points are also valid for the previous one, but uh, what happened in Libya? In Libya, there was 
like a complete misunderstanding of the desert as an ecosystem and as a social system. And uh, the idea was to create sedentary settlements, uh, both for settlers and for indigenous people. And then agriculture, of course, uh, was uh, European agriculture in the mind of the colonizers. Yes, so soil was the main, uh, soil was the main uh, concern. And in a reclamation generally we have soil and water. So soil in Libya was the main concern because uh, until like we, we have like earlier uh, reports about the quality of the soil in Libya and soil was classified mostly as sand. Uh, this was in 1912. And then again, the main uh, interest was also in the study of plants. There was the discovery of a completely new environment. This, this part is completely missing in the reclamation of the Pontine marshes. So the idea of that reclamation should start with studying the uh, peculiarities of the place. And also the, in, in the first picture, you see the difference between the presence of water and the lack of water in the plant development. But uh, we'll go a bit quick here. So in the first stage of the uh, Italian colonization, there was a lot of attention to indigenous plants, indigenous products, and also indigenous way to use water and storage water. When the fascists uh, started to develop their own idea of Libyan, uh, of an Italian Libya, this attention to the indigenous uh, uh, knowledge were completely uh, disregarded. So, and again, how they, what was the, uh, one of the pillar was the idea of a social project in Libya. So the um, demographic colonization that went hand in hand with the removal and of the uh, indigenous community. Uh, there are scholars talking about uh, genocide conducted by uh, Italians in the before 1932, that is the starting of the state uh, project of reclamation. So there was this idea of population replacement. The population replacement also occurred in the Pontine marshes. And then even here, how the soil, soil transformation was a big issue. And then again, uh, in this yeah, in these two pictures, you can see what are the effects of the uh, fascist reclamation and what was the, uh, how the fascist reclamation was portrayed. And the main element, of course, is, uh, is water. Finding water, creating water infrastructures uh, for animals and for, for humans and for plants was a key uh, component. While in, it, uh, in, uh, in domestic reclamation projects, there was the opposite need, how to drain water and to remove water. Yeah, this is again in this video there there's a lot of attention to infrastructure but no don't want to go it otherwise okay so uh yeah uh, we see that uh, the um, what was the outcome of the fascist reclamation in libya i mean we cannot we don't have a, a way to access, access, access uh, like this success or failure of a reclamation project. I think this is something we can also think how to develop a way to, to say that the project was successful or not. But the outcome is that for, uh, I mean, 60,000 Libyans were killed in the, uh, during the Italian fascist uh, uh, occupation of Libya and uh, 110,000 uh, were interned for a maximum of 40, 44,000 Italians stayed in Libya, not only farmers, but also uh, members of uh, the army. And only 0.2% of Libya's surface was transformed. And those were the uh, Italian villages. Yeah, I just want to pose a few uh, conclusive remarks and then maybe we can discuss this later. So there were, in when someone studies uh, the reclamation projects in Italy, I think this person can encounter two different conceptualizations of bonifica. The first one is an idea of bonifica as a series of micro transformations or as a series of macro transformations. So we can debate moving from the initial uh, definitions, what, what is bonifica and what we can call bonifica or if integral bonifica, fascist reclamation, that was this idea uh, uh, emerged in 19, to, in 1928, if this represents uh, a form of reclamation or is something completely different, because it's something that differs from what happened before and what happened uh, later. And yeah, Bonifica is an ecological, uh, I don't know, disaster, well, it's a, it's a sort of ecocide because there is, a, a, there is a, a disregard for the previous ecological seizures. 
And sometimes there is an open war against the ecology of a place because that was the intention uh, of it. Uh, and then, yeah, the other point is there is a shift from a rhetoric of water, the value of water to a rhetoric on land, from water hydraulic reclamation to uh, land reclamation. And yes, so social projects, social projects are always embedded into the new planning of new environments. And yeah, I thought that Russia component wants something that uh, pertain more to the colonial context, but we see that also like domestic um, domestic uh, reclamation projects had a Russia component. So thank you. I hope I bring the time. Almost perfect timing. Um, so um, we're taking a small break um, so that we can all refresh. And like I said in the beginning, maybe uh, chat more informally. Uh, we have here on the right side, there is a small refreshment banquet with some coffee, some snacks, uh, so we can all be fresh. And then we can reconvene again, let's say uh, 420. Um, so it's roughly on time. Great, thank you. Can I go? All right. So, um, hello everyone again. Um, welcome back after the, the break. Um, I, I must say that it's quite wonderful to be here. And thanks again for uh, to Irene and uh, uh, Daniele for the super invite and I have to say that I'm also kind of excited to talk in front of an audience of architects I'm not an architect so it's always a, a kind of a challenge and it's also an occasion um, for me to learn a lot what I've been hearing so far is very kind of enlightening and offering really like very much food for thought and I am very much also looking forward for uh, our next round table or discussion also in a more informal way before starting, also because you you kind of like you come from a background on architecture, I wanted to um, to connect uh, to the story of uh, of of the Bonifica, taking a kind of a detour, and sharing also a little bit of uh, um, you know uh, experiences in doing research, in teaching, in pedagogy, in education, and a little bit also to kind of deal with the question of the state of the art in architectural humanities and studies, and especially in relation to the question of, uh, you know, naming and language. It was very interesting also to uh, hear at the conclusion of Roberta's presentation that the question of language, you know, how shall we call it, how shall we define bonifica, no? what kind of uh, designations no, are at stake. And in, in the field of architectural studies, it's always a big challenge, at least for me, not coming from, from this world. And um, just to share a little story um, that I, I, I do very much work around the uh, questions of afterlife of uh, Italian fascist architecture, reuse of architectural heritage. And one, it happened very, very recently um, to submit a paper to an academic publisher quite, for an academic uh, um, um, journal in architecture, quite prominent and respected. 
And I had a very kind of interesting exchange with the editors and with the, the peer reviewers. In, in my title of this, uh, of this work that was dealing with, uh, you know, temporalities, uh, afterlife, uh, continuity between colonial fascist and post-colonial fascist architecture in Italy, uh, one of the comments that I received from uh, the, the editor and uh, the reviewer was that there is no such a thing as Italian fascist architecture. It was written in, 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 in the email saying there is no such, it doesn't exist, is incorrect use of the terminology. So from there I started a kind of very, um, as you can imagine, heated debate and fierce debate with the, with the editors. And um, of course, like from my perspective, I assume that the, the, the reviewer was coming from um, a tradition, a scholarly tradition that somehow um, connects style and formalism only through uh, the decisions of architects, designers, and state officials. Namely, you can name a style only if the designer, the state official, the expert, and the architect does so. And in reality, from this perspective, this review was absolutely true. Mussolini and the fascist regime never declared the existence of a fascist style, unitary style. To the conversation, I mean, I will not kind of bother you too much with that, but it went on and on with me asking at some point, but if we look at it from a non-formalist perspective and we think through the gaze, the, wit the, the testimony and the perspective of Libyans, Eritreans, Ethiopians, and we can continue with Greeks and Albanians and many others, that went through the yoke, under the yoke of Italian fascist colonialism, how shall we call this architect architecture without referring to the name of their oppressors? So the story, just to cut it short, is still ongoing. It still uh, is not solved yet, but for me, it was a very interesting lesson and a very kind of learning occasion to understand that uh, it's our responsibility as a matter of agency and claiming also space for reorienting the narratives around certain histories with a very kind of um, belief, a strong belief in, in mind that is not up to the architects in the thirties to decide about the heritage and the legacy. So this is like a very interesting tension. And I want us to start that because when uh, I received the invitation from uh, Irene and Daniele, I very much agreed with the rationale of this symposium, which was also kind of referring to the need to leave behind you know, isolated architectural objects. I think you use uh, the, the very strong language of hermetically sealed, which I very, very much liked, and uh, connect this kind of architecture, architecture to the territories. So to understand that uh, from an epicenter, from a perimeter, exists a whole world, a whole geography that needs not just to be deconstructed, but also analyzed. Uh, of course, like the question of, uh, um, of, of Italian architecture is very, is very problematic um, in, in, in relation to fascism, to, to its history. Also because uh, since the fall of the fascist regime, there was a huge problem in Italy, which was uh, the question of how to preserve the modern city without keeping the connection with fascism. So one of the, on, one of the operation that was uh, kind of triggered in the, in the immediate aftermath from architects, planners, but also from architectural historians and many intellectuals in the Italian, in the Italian world, in the Italian scene, was to make sure that in order to save modernity and the idea of modernization, you should kind of make sure that fascism is not mentioned, which means that you turn the architectural heritage or architecture in what, again, going through your words, an isolated object that needs to be and can only be looked and experienced from an aesthetic perspective, right? Um, this is also like also interesting, very, you know, there is, there is so much history to unpack, to think how, you know, our fascist architects, very enthusiastic fascist architects in the immediate aftermath had to kind of reconvert. They moved from, you know, uh, kind of hypermodernism into a sort of more organic architecture, more neorealist approach. But at the same time, the, pro the, the question was how to protect the social agenda of modernism and modernity from the totalitarian legacy. 
Of course, this is like a way to kind of what I call like to conceptualize or impose a model of architecture without fascism. No, this could not be tolerated. Of course, like if we put together the colonial question, it's even more controversial, right? Only recently, you know, there was like a, a great development in scholarship that kind of also kind of strived to put together the fascist experience in architecture with the colonial one, and also to understand what is the genealogy of this. In, in previous uh, pre presentation of Robert, this idea of also to see the maps and understand what is the overlap between geography is, is very interesting. And this was like a way, of course, you know, um, how uh, the question of an Italian modernity was achieved through urban planning, through architecture, and creating these sort of twin spaces between the Northern Hemisphere in Italy and in the Southern Hemisphere in the colonies. But the problem is that what is missing in these legacies uh, is the relocation of modernist architecture and modernization of, of an, as an expression of the same rationality that ties together Western civilization, colonialism, and fascism. So what I wanted to kind of like uh, stress is the importance to kind of keep this kind of blood relation between the three and understand how through a critical approach of reorientation of narratives on the history of this heritage can also help us to understand the key question of modernity and modernization. Also because like, you know, all, 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 also all the presentation that came before like managed to give a, a sense of what is at stake. And I want to add to this also the, the question of Sicily and to, to put it uh, as, uh, you know, also to tell a little bit of the story. Actually, what I will tell you is not uh, historical. I will share an experiment in pedagogy that I, I will get there immediately after. But of course, like we are talking about the South as a land that simultaneously following similar models of the Ente della Colonizzazione della Libia and others, the experiment of Pontin Marshes and other parts of in Sardinia and many other regions of, of Italy was again to kind of imagine paths of modernization that were shared under the same, um, you know, the same project, the one of internal colonization in Italy and external colonization in Africa. So the, this is like a map, this is a map that uh, somehow give you a sense of uh, what this is, could be called like one of the last experiment failed experiment of internal colonization in Italy that was made by the fascist regime in the early 40s. So also just to have a sense of the time frame, we understand that it's a very kind of a short living experiment. Eight rural settlements that were supposed to be built uh, in the eight, around the eight provinces of Sicily, while many others were left um, unbuilt somehow. So the Italian fascist regime funded uh, what is called the Ente di Colonizzazione del Latifondo Siciliano, which is uh, um, uh, exactly following the model of uh, uh, the Ente della Colonizzazione della Libia and colonial urban planning in Eritrea and in, in Ethiopia. The entity was uh, created to reform the Latifondo, which was the predominant system in Southern Italy for centuries. This consisted of large estates of agricultural plots that were owned by landlords, most of them absentee, were living somewhere else, they were living far from their holdings, and the landowners used uh, typically local middlemen and local thugs to, uh, to sublet to local peasants and firm farmers who needed the plops for self-sustainers. So fascism was uh, trying to address this very unproductive and also exploitative system and forcing a wave of modernization. So from between the 40, 1940 and 1943, the Ente built more than 2,000 homesteads and completed eight settlements in Sicily. So these planimetries that you see here um, were replicating the structures uh, that throughout the 30s uh, were already experimented in the Bonifica Integrale, land reclamation of the Pontin Marshes, uh, in Libya and the Horn of Africa. And it was interesting how this was, uh, you can look at the, at the built form no, in the drawing, in the sketches, uh, through the replica of uh, the same patterns. So you have leisure centers, you have piazzas, you have villas, you have schools, you have cinemas, monuments, and Casa del Fascio, which was uh, the fascist party headquarters. 
But again, in the name of uh, imperial geography, so again, going back to the question of language, interestingly, uh, they, those that were built uh, had to kind of also keep a strong relation with the colonies on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. So many of the villages that were built in Sicily were, for example, named after fascist martyrs, soldiers, settlers who had died in the overseas colonies. So from, from in a kind of, you know, um, let's go clockwise, you can have Borgo Bonsignore that is named after a carabiniere who died in the Battle of Gunugadu in Ethiopia in 1936, Borgo Fazio, and Borgo Giuliano after Italian settlers that were killed by freedom fighters in occupied Ethiopia. Just to understand how, again, this kind of uh, um, symmetry was needed on a kind of propagandist level, but also on a very kind of spatial and territorial level. So the reform of the Latifondo was, uh, of course, sought to implement a larger strategy of oppression, also of political dissent in, in, the, in the old country. The idea of, cre of uh, kind of modernizing the land that was deemed as uh, unproductive, backward with all this uh, kind of classical language was also a matter to kind of uh, move um, migrants and, settle and, and farmers from the north of Italy and kind of relocate them there. This was also done as a way to kind of break uh, political solidarity and anti-fascist struggles that was proliferating in certain area of the north. So the idea of uh, transforming the, uh, the, lab the laborer and the farmer into a settler was uh, also a process uh, of uh, social engineering. So it was again to kind of tackle uh, and, and address uh, um, a, 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 and, and create like patterns of social surveillance across the nation. All the Sicilian settlements were indeed designed following rationalist principles to express the same political and social Imperative. So there were closed communities somehow, right? That were geometrically closed in the urban layout and administratively closed to farmers, workmen, and outside visitors as well. So there was a, a class element that was very interesting also to notice with the vision of turning the waged agrarian laborer, uh, laborer into a land owner. So kind of creating this kind of a circu circularity. So Mussolini, of course, presented, you already said it, and, and, and it's a kind of, uh, it's presented in the propaganda also as a form of warfare, where, you know, the reclaimed marshes or land, are so-called unproductive, were kind of nurture, nurturing a sort of epic, no? That was the, that had to depict the swamps as un, un, unutilized land. So the, the interesting thing that despite all the fanfare of the regime, what we, we know also is that the history of these settlements is very short. After the Second World War, many of those were immediately abandoned. So it was a kind of also from the perspective of the regime, a total failure. And also they were kind of living in decay. You can, you can see also like when I talk about decay, you have different ca um, cases. On the left, of course, uh, with Borgo Bonsignore that is uh, in a much better preserved than the others that are totally abandoned. Today I wanted to kind of focus on one case, one, one village that is one of those. So it's like part of this history of, uh, you know, um, reclamation, uh, urban rural reclamation somehow in between, you know, like as uh, the fascist regime wanted to, to create this ambiguity between the two elements. And this is Borgorica, is, uh, is located in the province of Syracuse, and it's uh, um, very close to the local community, to the, to the village of Carlentini, which is actually, uh, the, is the local community that helped uh, me and my partners and friends from the art decolonizing architecture art research to create this experiment in pedagogy that kind of question the problem of reuse and critical reuse how we can use the built environment how we can uh, you know like experience or offer alternative experience of living fascist architecture in a critical way where we can develop alternative ways of experiencing the, the space and the land. So here you have, uh, again, a classic design with the Casa del Fascio in front of the church and on the left, the Ente di Colonizzazione.
you can see different corners. In order to engage and, and, and start this, uh, this and, and create this, this shared experience with the students and the local community, we decided to kind of very firstly reclaim one space that was the central one that was hosting the Ente della Colonizzazione, which is in, in our way, as a way also to mock the, the fascist language, we use, decided to use a, a different translation. Usually in English, you would call Ente, you translate it to institution or body. Instead, we wanted to use the entity because in the same time we wanted, and there was a need to mock the principles, the kind of Hegelian uh, transcendental principles of, uh, of, uh, of fascism that was used uh, you know, to kind of describing this kind of uh, um, colonizing experiences that were supposed to redeem the land. So the, the term that we decided to use is to stick to the question of entity. Um, the idea, it was to create a, a sort of a perpetual manifestation of Mark architectural heritage, art practice and critical pedagogy. So it's the idea also to kind of rethink uh, conservation in a different manners without kind of falling into the into the tropes or stereotypes of heritage and patrimony where you actually have to stick to the authentic standards and original ones. So it's again an attempt to think critically through the lens of originality and authenticity. What does it mean to preserve today these kind of spaces? Is it possible to have uh, alternative ways? And especially as a matter of agency, who can do that? Who can claim the right to reuse this kind of heritage? And how far is possible to subvert also these principles, right? How the reuse of these villages that were built to celebrate fascist ideology can be like subverted and overturned? Know how to, to use the spaces to create and steer a culture that is becoming an antidote to fascist politics. So in an attempt, <clears throat> this is quite an attempt to, um, to uh, fix the social fabric and histories that fascism broke, to heal the history of spatial, social and political isolation in which the village originates. And further is also an attempt to, pedag to heal pedagogy itself from within a space that was firstly created as a pedagogical hammer in the hands of the regime propagandist. So we have, of course, you see how the, how the, how the village is somehow designed, but the interesting thing that we came when we met the local community of Carlentini that joined us in this experiment, we kind of came with the idea of addressing only the traumas that were created by the fascist history. The interesting thing is that when you start working with the local communities that many other forms of trauma are kind of emerging. One of those is related to the agrarian reform that came immediately afterwards, the, uh, the, the fall of fascism. Uh, the, the depopulation that all the region experience. So like, again, like a circular -like history of outward migration, inward migration, and new processes of modernization, which I will mention also later afterwards. So this suggests that the need to imagine forms of public preservation outside of the idea of saving the village via restoration is the school wants to introduce to, to new public alternative modes of heritage making. So in that sense, is also to kind of think this architecture as an example of isolated entities and bodies and lands, and how we can rethink forms and patterns of reconnection between this world that has been broken. Our discussion in this sense centralizes that the architecture, rurality and migration histories in order to identify the possibilities and limitations embedded in analyzing and understanding the formation of what is a decolonial sense of place. In order to do that, I, I just wanted to give you, give you a sense of what were our attempts and experiments in critical pedagogy. So the Assyria represents basically the first tool of critical reappropriation of the space that was that we decided to place in front of the building of Ente de la Decolonizzazione. 
And as a way to kind of set up a communal space, a sort of living room, starting to occupy the space, which was later become a little bit the trademark and the iconic symbol of the old pedagogical experience. So what you see are like a collection of six Palestinian rugs that I went to collect from the Al-Khalil market with the Sandilal, who is a part of the project as well, and decided to kind of take, a, to try to find a way to contaminate and profanate this, the space, the square and the buildings set by fascist architects. It was also a way to bring a little bit of ourselves, and that was done in cooperation with the local community. As you could see, we are also sitting in chairs. All the furnitures that were collected were a donation of the local community. So we decided as a way to kind of oh, to get uh, to get a grip of the op oppressive um, architecture of the space, we decided to try to find the different ways to create a, a communal living, a communal experience that would help us, you know, to come to terms with the history of the place and also where the local community was sharing their different uh, histories and mem memories from the past. So it was somehow, the, the Asira, it's, it's not just a carpet, it's a decorated carpet that he is used in Palestine, but in general, also in the, in the Arab world, as, a, as a, is used for prayer and as a convivial home space to welcome guests in the shade of the olive trees and during the olive harvest. So this was our way, a ritual that would come time to time and was also a way for us to escape from the functional logic that kind of dominates and organizes this place. But in order to go uh, back to the, to the question and to the point that was made in the, in the call of Irene and, and Daniele, so this, this, this desire and this need to get out, to learn how to, you know, to move away from, uh, from uh, the isolation of the object, the isolation of the space, we also noticed that uh, people, students, uh, locals, uh, um, and all the guests that were part of this experience, uh, kind of like progressively also, this, you could also feel an organic desire to move out of the, of the perimeter of the space. And, and this is uh, mm, something that, uh, um, that uh, helps us also to understand the very nature of the settlement. The settlement is what we could kind of define like as the blueprint of modernist colonization in many contexts. So this is a, a place uh, wherein the violence of modernization that is stirred by modernist visions extends and is given a complete new geography. So for us as a way to kind of, again, abandon the formalism that architecture imposes on us was also a matter to try to reconnect to the land, to, to exit the perimeter. The first way, and this is always, of course, like it's, it's, this is also very much work in progress. And I'm, 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 I'm sharing like experiences that uh, us as, as a group of, uh, you know, educators, students, the local community had the, the, the space and the time to discuss together. And it was a matter for us, like while escaping the perimeter also to, to go and look for clues. What does it mean to escape? Which kind of threads are we looking for? And one of the most kind of evident and, and kind of clear was, was the presence of eucalyptus plantation all around the island. So uh, um, around the many of these villages, clusters of eucalyptus, and not only in Borgorica, were planted by the entity colonization in the 40s, very quick, no? So eu eucalyptus is also a little bit, you know, as a, a hallmark of Italian settler colonialism in Libya and the Horn of Africa. And, and it was also kind of used because of the invasive roots. The invasive roots was supposed, you know, to, and then it was also kind of, uh, this was also very mythological and very epic to kind of take out, uh, you know, to drain the swamp and, uh, uh, and, and, and purify the lands that were affected by malaria. So it was a kind of a means of arboreal uh, conquest somehow. Then of course, it's not only Italian, on the contrary, it's like, uh, it's a trademark of settler colonialism in Australia in different other parts in India and South Africa, and in Palestine especially, also for, for understanding what is the role of vegetation in the colonial present. 
is a, is a eucalyptus plant, plantation are used from the beginning of the 20th century by the um, by the Zionist movement and the Jewish National Fund to take over vast parts of the Nakab deserts, for example. So it's a, it's an ongoing tool of, of, of conquest and colonization, right? The interesting thing is that in the context of Sicily, the role played by the eucalyptus doesn't stop with the end of fascism. And this is like another part of the, of the work in progress that we are trying to put together because it continues afterwards with the time of the agrarian reform that was initially supposed to tackle the problem of land restitution in the South and taking and taking expropriating it from the latifundists. But despite this attempt, uh, South and Lat latifundists were not defeated. And the reaction to the expropriation, attempted expropriation was very violent. So they managed to get, for example, some of the expropriated land to be reassigned through coercive actions. They succeeded in taking control of large portions of land where municipalities had implemented forestry projects. So the provincial forestry departments were themselves controlled by latifundists and promoted the planting again of fast growing trees such as eucalyptus. So the interesting thing is that the eucalyptus is, a, is an element, is an actor that bears again the traces of kind of continuities of genealogies of uh, um, legacies that kind of creates a constant and ongoing overlap. And this was, of course, associated for different purposes, not anymore under the narrative or the epic of, of you know, draining the swamps, but in a very kind of materialist sense was used by the latifundists to kind of supply uh, agreements with Italian and foreign paper mills. So as a, as a way to kind of produce business and money. What, what, what I was saying before, and just to give you a sense of how this exploration progresses, is, is, uh, is again to understand the eucalyptus as, as a living trace that uh, allow us to put dots together and connect different phases of the history of modernization and the politics of modernization in Sicily. That goes through before, of course, uh, from Latifundi to, um, to the fascist uh, reclamation and modernization, to the agrarian reform in the aftermath of fascism. But of course, like it deals with questions of economic transformation and new modernization and mechanization that happened in the area around the coast, the Eastern coast, uh, uh, the, it's a piece of land that stretched somehow, see better here in the map from the North in Augusta until the end in this strip of land in Syracuse. Uh, new forms of modernization that occurred in the, in the era between Augusta, Melilli, Priolo, and Siracusa from 1949 onwards. And this was a process that involved like American financial institution in the Italian agricultural reform that started also with the money of the Marshall Plan, which had allocated billions, right, of dollars for the reconstruction of Italy. On the one end, for investment of the agricultural sector, but particularly for for, you know, in the mechanization process, land drainage and the struggle, of course, against malaria. A new amount of money were put like in, electric, in electrical industry, chemical industry, iron and steel, and of course, automobile. So the industrial area that runs between this area is a territory whose economy had been for centuries uh, devoted to activities based on extensive agriculture. This is something to keep in mind, right? The cultivation of almonds, uh, olive trees, uh, citrus, uh, and sheep farming later. This is like what the, this is the ecosystem of this part of Sicily for a century. And inter interestingly, in 49, in a matter of a decade, it was transformed in one of the most polluted industrial areas of Sicily. So the rapidity and extent of this industrialization process have radically changed the social and economic features of the area, altering the structure of both human and natural environments. So agriculture was of course impacted greatly through the introduction of mechanization and new productive techniques and products coming from the chemical industry that you see in all the fields. We are talking about a really a long stretch of land. It's quite impressive to move from the fields in the, in the, in the hills of Carlentini and approach the coast that is carved by, by, by the petrochemical fields. 
The interesting thing is that the, the mechanization, of course, kind of just uprooted the different forms of, of local farming, but at the same time, it, it, it was not a, a, the fact that the mechanization came and the petrochemical fields was, in, was established did not mean that the labor that was working in the farms move straight forward into the, into the petrochemical fields. This is why, because uh, most of the technical and management personnel came from the north of Italy, somehow, and from the United States. So nonetheless, some Sicilians found work over the years, especially as white collar employees and low cost local workers who were trained to specialize. So interestingly, this is also another phase of uh, an ongoing pattern of outward migration from Sicily and depopulation, right? Agriculture in this strip of land technically disappears. Extensive agriculture like, is uh, absolutely going through, 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 through a pattern of erasure. Farmers were converting or trying to, to convert and live and migrate further. So th this development, the interesting thing is that this development was subordinated to strategies that were elaborated out of Sicily uh, and their choices never considered any real environmental planning and likewise never tried to establish a balance between private interests, local growth and social needs. So, and other economic alternatives were totally largely ignored. So the island of Sicily at this historical interchange became a kind of a district for basic, basic chemicals, a floating oil platform in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. I'm going towards the conclusion because I wanted also to give you another sense of the, another thread that we would like to, to, to kind of explore with, the, and we started exploring also, which again kind of add another element of an, an analysis and possible exploration because where I also referred to the question of depopulation and the outward migration, but in a kind of, a, in, the, in, the, in the history of the island, we know that uh, the migration happened in circular ways. So, um, emptied lands, change of, uh, of uh, uh, agricultural patterns and change of the population, of course, that takes care of uh, the arable, also called arable land. New migrant flows, um, I, I, don't, I don't have the expertise and the knowledge to, to elaborate on, on this, but I just wanted to kind of share, like again, another last thread of inquiry or possible inquiry in order to understand the ramification of, 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 of modernization and modernity and modernism in the land, through the land, as a way to understand this geography, not just through the land, but also the bodies that are organized and they are disciplined. So, and how modernization flows, right? And, and how uh, modernization is also always a matter of control of mobility. Before we, we were kind of, uh, I was trying to, to, to go very fast through the, through the question of, uh, of how the, the modernization and the reclamation of the Southern lands implied a state-sponsored driven migration from the North to transform through a process of social engineering, you know, the farmer into a landowner or small settlers. And again, here we are in a kind of similar situation where modernizing process are a matter of organizing and controlling mobility, no? And also this is a, the, the and, and I'll really kind of give a few insights. This is pictures from the, from the so-called uh, village for migrant seasonal workers in the area of Cassibile, which is just a little bit, few kilometer south of Syracuse, where this is the area of, of a potato cultivation. So when we went there, it was not the season. And the, the, the interesting and kind of a controversial, paradoxical and dramatic decision of the authorities was to kind of try to um, fix the problem, no? I'm using their language, fix the problem of uh, seasonal migrant workers that come to work in the, in the potato fields that were also used to squat and created a so-called kind of like informal um, settlements around the city and waiting for, for for, for, for a day in the fields, um, the municipalities and the, together with the unions decided to, to create a kind of a, um, fenced villages where um, the migrants would go and uh, slip and being called for going to work as a way through the work, through the words of the union to tackle and try to fight the uh, scar of Caporalato, which is like this exploitative and, and low wage uh, system uh, 
um, that exploit uh, informal work. Uh, but the interesting thing uh, was uh, to see in this uh, process, uh, there was another form of ghettoization somehow, no? where the, the, the population and the people that go to work is fenced police and they cannot even cook and they have like they are charged 10 euros a day for their meals. So this is, was uh, another, another thing that, uh, that is kind of also defining another um, thread of, of exploration. I wanted to kind of conclude with a question um, why also that relates also to the, to the title of, the, of, the, of this presentation and why, why emplacement. Um, I, I kind of wanted to argue that one of the effects of modernization is in the present is a, is a form of displacement, right? And this is not something experienced like through this uh, pedagogical experiment, but it's a, um, a, a kind of lesson uh, that I've, I've been also kind of learning and inspired by what is called emplacement in a, as, a, as a pedagogical tool um, in in context of uh, um, settler in post uh, settler colonial context, if I think about uh, experimental pedagogies that since uh, the 2015 roads must fall have been nurtured mostly in South Africa, no? which seek to use architecture and use materiality as a space in the teaching and as an affecting tool to uh, reformulate pedagogy. So when 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 of course like I'm I'm referring to space is a is, is, is a matter of uh, understanding the material process that makes it, but also is a matter of meaning, no? Going back to the initial provocation that I wanted to, to pick on, no? The idea of like how we call things, what, what is the use of language that we make, right? How we need also to kind of struggle to redefine and invent new terminology. And on the other hand, as a known, I'm not an architect, but I'm using architecture as my methodology also. It's also kind of to, 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 to to push and to use emplacement as a way to understand architecture as, a, as an epistemic field that offers con continuously and furiously an, an incredible amount of traces. But uh, it's also a way to kind of uh, imagine architecture as a curatorial practice more than in terms of building and uh, destroying and demolishing. It's uh, as a curatorial practice that creates uh, um, sometimes difficult experiences of uh, uh, intimacy and uh, can create uh, the path and the space to reconnect, uh, you know, different lives, livelihoods, uh, words uh, that otherwise would be kept isolated by those forms that comes from a very strong uh, modernist, modern tradition. So just as a conclusion, um, I think we should consider in, in a way we, we are dealing with, with these issues, I would suggest that architectural heritage could also be abandoned somehow. So let's abandon the, you know, perspectives and get certain gazes and certain approaches also as a way to disconnect in a way to reconnect under different language and forming a new vocabulary. Thank you. Here we are. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Miltiadis. I'm a social anthropologist, as Irena mentioned before, based at Durham University. And first of all, I want to thank uh, Daniela and Irene for organizing this wonderful event and all the other presenters for their fascinating papers. And it is really wonderful being here uh, in person. And I share Daniela's emotional. Um, <laughs> emotional state uh, in terms of this is really wonderful. And uh, as a social anthropologist, I'm interested 
mainly in the ways of uh, in which the bonifica is represented, negotiated, and contested in contemporary Italy. Uh, in the next 20 to 25 minutes, I will focus on the role of the bonifica as narrative in public commemorations and national and local historical visions. I will start with a brief introduction um, on the geography and history of the bonifica integrale, though uh, the other presenters have done a much better job uh, than I will do in, in discussing the historical uh, context of the bonifica. And then I will present uh, my ethnographic material. The talk is organized in four broad areas, each looking at the historical background, the role of the bonifica in public commemorations, fascism's absent presence in these commemorations, and the ways in which the marshes have outlived the Rome destruction. And this is actually a slightly reduced version from what was included in the abstract so that I'm able to present it in a little bit more depth. Before starting, I will just give a very, very quick note on methodology. My data is for the most part ethnographic and centers on people's everyday life. So rather than focusing on the Bonifica as a historical event that occurred almost a century ago, I'm interested in understanding how it endures in people's lives today and what meanings uh, it takes. This is, what, this is why my title, in my title I speak of the afterlife of the Bonifica and that actually should have been a plural noun because uh, as the afterlives, because really the Bonifica still exists in many different ways. And uh, as a narrative, it serves many different uh, purposes. And I should also mention that I consider myself, I self-identify as a Latinense, so someone who comes from Latina, which is the city I do my field work in. And I grew up there, lived there until the age of 17. And so uh, my work is inevitably thus informed by my subjectivity. So let's start with a brief introduction to the historical background. If you were to travel south from Florence uh, just over a century ago, uh, once you passed Rome on your journey, you will enter a territory called the Agro Pontino or uh, Pianura Pontina. It is the territory here on the map. And you know, you've know you seen uh, from Roberta's presentation before also uh, another map. And that's down there is Rome, so the, the one in the orange circle, so it gives you a bit of uh, geographical perspective. And this is the sort of landscape you would have encountered. Uh, the Pianura Pontina is in fact characterized by a plain whose boundaries are on one side the mountains and on the other the sea. However, between the plain and the sea there are dunes that prevent the water from draining, so this water collects. And this territory became uh, thus known as the Pontine Marshes or the Paludi Pontina. It constituted, as uh, other presenters have already mentioned, it constituted one of the largest wet areas in Europe. And it was a, really a unique ecosystem where multiple species thrived and which humans learned to adapt to. And in fact, people engaged in all sorts of economic activities and coexisted with the harsh environment and the risks associated with life in the marshes especially malaria. Now, if you travel to the same area today, this is what you see. This is the city of Latina. And nearby there are other new towns, um, for example, this town of Aprilia, Pontina, Pontinia, and many other satellite towns or Borghi. So how did we get from this to this? This is quite of a big change in, in the landscape. Well, you would have guessed by now after all so many presentations. In the 1920s, the fascist regime embarked in, or rather continued, a huge engineering project of land reclamation, which is um, referred to as the Bonifica Integrale. And throughout history, multiple attempts uh, at draining the marshes had, had, uh, had been started. And the fascist regime managed to do this through a system of man-made canals and pumps called Idrovore, which channeled the water um, towards the sea and pumped it over uh, the dunes into the sea. So here um, on the big photo, the big um, picture, you see all the canals that are in the uh, area, the denser area uh, where all the strict line are, are the man-made canals. And on the other side, you see instead how the pumps work. So um, the above um, diagram shows how the water doesn't manage to go over the dune, while 
Uh, the one below shows uh, how the pumps work to bring the water uh, across to the sea. And this was a very big undertaking um, that the regime uh, did, which involved many migrant workers coming from other parts of Italy. And the aim was not just to get rid of the water, but for the rebirth of the entire territory. So this was the way in which it was pictured. And over 3,000 settlers' uh, farmhouses called poderi were built uh, to accommodate settlers coming from primarily the northeast of Italy. So from, from for example, the regions of Friuli Venezia Giulia and Veneto through a process of internal migration, which was not always by independent choice, um, as I think Emilio was uh, talking about. And, and this became an actual colonization of the territory. So you see here uh, a farmhouse, one of the farmhouses that were built in the area, which are still, they're still standing, many of them. The apoderamento or the land division uh, was managed by the Opera Nazionale Combattenti or the National Combatants Foundation, which also dealt with the needs of veterans. So many first settlers were actually veterans of the first war. Latina was built in 1932 uh, with the name of Littoria. Uh, the name was changed after the end of World War II for obvious reasons for, being, uh, for having this strong resonance with the fascist regime. And it was built as an administrative center, and it soon became the most important town of the Agropontino. So this is a photo of Latina, uh, a recent photo of Latina. And the fascist regime really inscribed the urban environment with, with its power and symbolism, a lot of which is still visible today. That's a famous building uh, in Latina, famous, that's a well-known building in Latina, which uh, was built, it's called the Palazzo M or M Palace, which was built in uh, the shape of an M in honor of Mussolini, of course. Despite an initial reticence from Mussolini's part to celebrate the foundation of the new city, because he didn't think that it was uh, something important, um, actually the, the Bonifica and the new towns, uh, and, and as these, these new settlements were called, so all these new cities that were built on the reclaimed land were collectively called new towns, um, they quickly received national and international attention, so much so that Latina, or actually Littoria at the time, came to be recognized as the pearl of the Duce. The way the Bonifica was represented publicly through the lens of the fascist propaganda machine was that of a war against wilderness. As uh, other presenters have already mentioned uh, and scholars have written about, between the 19th and 20th century, the marshes, and this was in general, not just uh, the Paludi Pontine, came to be associated more and more as matter out of place. They are described through their darkness and existential alterity. Mariani writes, is a scholar who wrote uh, a lot about Latina and the Bonifica, in popular perception, and especially among foreigners, the marshes were connected to, the, to a myriad of legends of different types. However, their fame was especially connected to their perennial inviolability, to their capacity to break throughout the centuries any attempt that had been made to redeem them. And the regime very much relied on these representations to depict the Pontine marshes as a place to be redeemed and saved from itself. Again, um, Grupuso, who's uh, another uh, scholar who writes about uh, water and, and in, in the Pontine territory, highlights that fascist propaganda represented the Pontine marshes as a disorderly place from a social point of view as much as a sanitary and moral one in need to be saved. The regime itself was presented as the bearer of civilization and modernity, and it embarked on a fundamental quest which came down to being really a fight between nature as untamable, uncivilized, savage, and culture, modern technological. These discourses, it should be noted, also resonated very much with colonial discourses of savagery versus modernization and culture, and ultimately the West. The marshes were thus given a lesser value as something that the country should have and could have disposed of. The Bonifica and the birth of new cities was thus seen very much as a genesis, a rebirth, a creation story. 
the Bonifica was such an extended intervention that it heavily and permanently altered the landscape and the environment. And if you've come across uh, somewhat recently, it was also written into this sort of creation story in the recent novel by, somewhat recent novel by Pennacchi, Canale Mussolini. Now, um, as I mentioned before, I'm an anthropologist. So, and, and my, the other presenters have already given you a lot of historical background. So I will move to the ethnographic material. The memory of the Bonifica is still very, very vivid in Latina. It is remembered in the urban environment and in those urban elements that date back uh, to its foundation, many of which have survived the fall of the fascist regime. For example, the fountain uh, in the picture on your right uh, of Piazza della Libertà or Freedom Square, which depicts uh, wheat over water to symbolize the victory of, agri of, of agriculture, of, um, of the marshes and the economic and social redemption of the Agropontino. Or the Consorzio per la Bonifica, the organization in charge of overseeing the works of the Bonifica, which is still active. And this building shows uh, there a map uh, of the Bonifica, of the state of the Bonifica in 1937. In the wider territory of Latina, canals still trace lines in the landscape, like blue veins carrying the precious but insidious water to the pumps. And of course, there are the pumps, the rovore, which still make it possible for the water to reach the sea. The memory of the Bonifica has also been renewed after the fall of the regime and the end of World War II. Roads are named after pioneers or pionieri, individuals who were fundamental to, and in some cases sacrificed their lives for the Bonifica to happen. P pioneers are also remembered as a symbolic and collective group, such as in the Piazzale dei Bonificatori. Bonificatori is uh, a word to say those who carried out the Bonifica, or via Pionieri della Bonifica. And on the 18th of December of every year, celebrations take place to commemorate the city's foundation and combine solemn celebrations in the presence of authorities and public entertainment in Latina streets and cultural venues. In 2015, during my fieldwork, I attended uh, a few events organized um, to celebrate Latina's 83rd anniversary. Like every other year on this special recurrence, the mayor of the city and other authorities celebrate the foundation of the city by laying a breath in front of a monument commemorating the fallen pioneers of the Bonifica, the Monumento ai Caduti della Bonifica, which is also known more generally as the Monument to the Bonificatore. The monument located in Latina's Piazza del Quadrato, which is a squared piazza built uh, on the site of Latina's first settlement, which was called Villaggio del Quadrato, or Village of the Quadrato, and Quadrato literally means square, the, ge the uh, geometrical shape of the square, and it was the name given to the first settlement, which was originally in the shape of a square. And this monument is composed of a, uh, sorry. This monument is composed of a fountain uh, with a central statue. And the statue depicts a man engaged, and you can see there in the background, a man engaged in strenuous physical work as he pulls a manhole cover to regulate the water flow symbolizing the effort that it took to free the territory from the marshlands. An inscription states, to the bonificatori, who for the redemption of the land and of men donated their lives. On both sides of the fountain, there are spades blades le leaning in a circle one next to the other, reminding of the work that it took to free um, the land of water. The Piazzale dei Bonificatori thus in its history and materiality is an evocative and emblematic place for the commemoration of the city's foundation. And my field tour started shortly after the city's mayor was actually ousted. And so on the day, on this particular day, the speech was given by the prefectorial commissioner instead of the mayor in the presence of other authorities, school children, and the city's mu musical band. The prefectorial commissioner gave a speech during which he stated that the monument to the Bonificatori reminds us that the memory and the roots of the city of Latina are strongly tied to the history of this territory, a history made not only of work and sacrifice, but also of hope and success, 
a strenuous history written by Latinensi, whom in over 80 years have demonstrated the capacity to overcome the most difficult situations, from environmental ones tied to the marshy nature of a territory that transformed in a fertile and productive land, to the social ones characterized by the necessity to integrate different cultures and ethnicity through the construction of a common sense of identity and citizenship. These are the fundamental values of the Latinense community. During the event, the city's band played a well-known patriotic song, the Song of the Piave, written at the end of World War I. More recently, the Bonifica was used again by Latina's current mayor as a metaphor to symbolize the city's and the council's work against criminality, a different redemption of the city that, however, relied on the same idea of freeing the territory. The celebrations continued with the unveiling of a mural painting located in the Casa del Combattente, or the Fighter's House, a building of fascist heritage. I was curious to see the artistic work, which was titled The Combattente, and so I walked into the cramped venue. The event had been advertised on local social media and newspapers, and the mural painting was located at the end of a spiral staircase, and I could not quite make it to the top, as you can see in my poor attempt to take a photo of the painting on the day. And while I engaged in a balancing act on the steps, um, while I was squished by the crowds, the mural painting was finally unveiled. unveiled. And in the foreground there, uh, there is an ordinary man wearing simple beige and dark uh, green clothing and a military helmet standing in a field of wheat. He holds a rifle in his right hand and a shovel in his left. He's lightly turned so that the shovel is in a higher position than the rifle and receives more light. In the background on the right are mountains and stylized depictions of Cheval de Frise, defensive obstacles built with wood and barbed wire used among other conflicts during World War I. On the left, there is the city hall of Latina, which you would recognize from the photo uh, from before, cultivated fields, the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Cape Circeo, an iconic natural site located near the city. The mural painting thus creates a visual, imaginative and temporal connection embodied by the fighter in the foreground between World War I, symbolized by the war imagery and the mountains where much of the fighting occur and the city. The painting, as reported by a local newspaper, was dedicated to the sacrifice of many soldiers involved in the terrible tragedy, which was World War I, those who, su who survived and who conquered another land, the marshland, fighting over nature and reclaiming it. Their hard work carried out with great sacrifice and often tied with their own lives has given to our community fertile lands to cultivate and a city where to live. In both representations, so in both the painting and the monument, the main element is that of an ordinary by, but a heroic man, of his sac and a man, never a woman, of course, and of his sacrifice and hard work, epitomized by the spade, necessary for the success of the Bonifica and ultimately Latina's creation. The painting and the celebrations, especially uh, during the playing of the Piave song, create a strong sequentiality between World War I and the events of the Bonifica, placing the Bonifica within a wider and linear historical narrative. The ways in which the Bonifica is talked about in these instances embeds it in other narratives and temporalities. In both the commissioner's speech and in the materiality of the square and the mural painting, the Bonifica is articulated as part of the history of the people who made Latina's foundation possible in connection with the virtues of contemporary and past Latinancy as a whole. A clear connection is made between events of World War I the Bonifica and the city of Latina, locating the Bonifica within a broader narrative of sacrifice, struggle, and heroism. The painting and the music played by the band also contextualize Latina's history within a national historical narrative by evoking visually and acoustically a crucial event in the history of the nation. By creating such a strong link between the Bonifica and World War I, embodied by the man holding the uh, rifle and the spade or the song, the patriotic song, the representations restore momentarily the linearity of history, despite the fact that Latina, as it is celebrated during those commemorations, did not exist until 1932, so after uh, World War One. Something else that these narratives have in common is also the absent presence of fascism. 
fascism silencing or passing unacknowledged occurs despite the profound constitutive relation that connects the bonifica to the ventennio or the 20 years of fascist rule. The bonifica exists because of the regime and its history, its ideology, and Latina as well exists because of the regime and its history, its ideology and its policies. It is its direct product, and it could be argued one of its most celebrated ones uh, at the time. Nonetheless, the bonifica and the bonificatori, or the pioneers, are used precisely to talk about the city's history without having to mention fascism. This is the only way in which Latina's history can be celebrated publicly and the only way in which it can become part of a national historical narrative. If fascism were not silenced, this would obviously not be possible for obvious reasons. And also considering the way in which the Italian constitution was drafted according to the anti-fascist values of the Resistenza after the 1946 referendum that proclaimed the Italian Republic. Anti-fascism became therefore a unifying narrative for the nation after the difficult years of fascist rule and the resistance and for establishing a national historical narrative. The Bonifica's narrative, including its silences, becomes therefore an act that negotiates, re-elaborates, and overcomes the city's history and the implications of coexisting with its contentious past, which endures as history, memory, and materiality. For grounding the Bonifica as a narrative that de-emphasizes fascism's central role in the Bonifica creates a space during which public celebrations where Latin history can be talked about, shared, and even celebrated. And they can be so as part of national history. The ethnography shows how people shared narratives to create a history that could momentarily work by briefly eluding the paradigms of national history and partly silencing the fascist past. In these narratives, history becomes momentarily malleable. The city's history becomes one of heroism and linearity with the past and the present. The Bonifica's narrative becomes a time space that allows for memory in its silences or absences to be specially constituted through material, such as the monuments, and non-material forms, such as the performances. So understanding ethnographically fascism's absent presence in contemporary Italy shows how it is experienced locally and dealt with in everyday life. Latina's case opens up an important question regarding the malleability of history and how the meanings of fascism are articulated through people's experience, what they make of it daily, how they confront it, and how they can exist despite, against, and because of fascism's hubs and presence. Moreover, the ethnography informs broader discourses on how the nation is performed through its past. The ethnographic case of Latina, therefore, therefore, informs but also complicates significantly debates on the presence of fascism in contemporary Italy and how the past permeates and shapes the present. And to conclude this talk, I will share a few examples of how, despite its almost total destruction, the palude or the marshes still permeate uh, the city. This is Latina's crest, which states in Latin, Latina olim palus, or Latina was was once a marsh. So it's remained in very much in the memory rather than you know mentioning the Bonifica, this mentions the marshes. But the marshes have also become a trope that like the Bonifica have come to symbolize the city. Despite uh, the prominent role that the Bonifica occupies in public commemorations. My friends often ask me, when are you coming back to the Palude? A satirical Facebook page is called Latina Swamp. And Swamp is also an anti-fascist group or Collective Antifascista and a festival called Swamp Fest. And there's many more of these examples. So the marshes are still this collective trope through which people uh, identify the city. They've resisted this sort of prominent role that the uh, Bonifica has taken in public commemorations. All this ethnographic material shows how the afterlives of the Bonifica are complexly articulated in Latina. They act as a narrative that allows the city's past to be remembered despite fascism. It is embedded in the very urban fabric of the city through monuments and places that contains and performs that memory, but it is also contested, reminding us that the meanings of the Bonifica today and its afterlives are dynamic and are continuously re-elaborated as part of Latina's present. Okay, that was awesome. Thank you all. 
Um, like we mentioned in the program, I will still suggest to do a short break, uh, just maybe five, 10 minutes. It's 5.42, so let's do 5.50, 10 minutes to six, so we can just re refresh. And then I really encourage the students, especially not to plead the, the side of uh, exchange, which is the best side to be in. Thank you. I think in this case, we're going to. It's okay. Doesn't matter. Um, so in this space, we're gonna. I think uh, Irene is gonna start here. So okay. this mic should still be on, and then I think they're gonna. I'm gonna invite them to sit here. Oh, okay. Okay. For the first part, they can keep the mic off, and then. So, thanks for enduring until now. Um, I guess we have just over 30 minutes for our final discussion before, well, I was going to try and sort of draw some reflections and points of intersection between these four really wonderful presentations. Thank you so much once again for being here and for putting so much effort in addressing the theme of today's uh, symposium. I think there was a really great kind of fit and complementarity between the various approaches. Um, and once again, also thank you, Daniele, so much for all of your organizational work. Um, I really appreciate. Um, I'll try and be very brief to leave space for um, dialogue and comments from the audience as well as responses from uh, the presenters. Um, I think all four presentations really uh, brought out in a very clear way kind of what we um, envisions in the prompt for for today which is the intersection between what we might see as different layers in in kind of the, the bonifica as a trope sort of keeps together so you have of course the technical aspect but which intersects with the political one and we've talked about uh, property regimes we've heard about property re regimes we've heard about kind of uh, different polities being invested uh, in, in the work of reclamation and that, that, that was also the work of nation building, right? Um, an ever incomplete one. So I think also all these processes um, are by default uh, incomplete, conflictual, and ever sort of changing ones, right? And then, so of course the political intersects with the symbolic in, in kind of in terms of uh, nation building, but also in terms of the values that are attributed to um, different kinds of labor and class. Uh, gender was kind of in the background, but I think it, it featured, especially of course in the ways in which Kind of pioneering is very much sort of uh, understood as a male kind of endeavor as more generally is the kind of conquest and taming of wilderness and the land. Um, and therefore, of course, this is also an effective uh, process, one that kind of 
elicits uh, different uh, kinds of uh, dispositions, responses, um, and uh, that may be more or less kind of oppositional or celebratory, for example. Um, and of course, um, the symbolic uh, intersects with the material. I mean, not just in the uh, technical sense, also, of course, the, the architectural, the built environments, but uh, the materiality of bodies being affected by disease or uh, fatigue or um, different kinds of afflictions, and of course, the ecological. Um, the second point I wanted to bring out uh, concerns the temporalities. And I think um, here really, um, particularly Andrea's paper or presentation really helped us, but also Roberta's, to move beyond the still very prevalent idea in, well, in, <laughs> public imagination in this country about Bonifica as a fascist endeavor, um, which is also, of course, which was also part of the way in which the fascist regime wanted to picture itself as the kind of great achiever of uh, a feat that was never attempted or never um, Succeeded like like it did under fascism, and uh, and even I mean I think Andrea sort of even went beyond our own very kind of prompts what that started, sort of started from uh, you know the late 18th century as the kind of so the the, the uh, wake of capitalist agriculture to show the ways in which uh, processes of primitive accumulation are actually you know, deeper uh, and much more extensive. So thank you for that. Um, and, uh, and of course, Roberto's work is also very useful in um, helping us to understand how kind of the contemporary history of Bonifica starts uh, in the Pontine Marshes starts way before uh, fascism itself, although, of course, in your reading, fascism also kind of introduced quite a radical sort of break. And I, I would be curious to hear more about what exactly you think that break uh, is, in a sense, because I think that this opens up uh, um, I wouldn't say a, a conflict, but it opens up a, a a contradiction between, on the one hand, what I was saying before, the kind of need, I think, for us to uh, de-fetishize fascism as something completely kind of different from any other kind of political project that um, came before or even that uh, uh, outlasted its demise and then to see um, how kind of it belongs to modernity, you know, like it, it's one instance of modern kind of politics to also go back to Emilio's uh, own uh, paper. But then on the other hand, you have Ele Elena's point about the unsayable nature of fascism, which in a way, I mean, kind of is also related to its, its exceptionalism, like to the fact that it's it's so exceptional, right? Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on this, because I'm, I'm, I struggle myself to kind of um, seek to analyze kind of uh, also today's um, references to and echoes of fascism in contemporary Italian politics, for example. And Latina has given us quite a few examples, of course, of kind of how the nostalgia for fascist times is, is still uh, very much alive, but Latina is not an, an exception uh, in this sense. But uh, how do we understand this kind of attachment to fascism in particular as a, you know, uh, as a political trope um, in the present. 
Um, another theme or kind of um, set of themes that I think came uh, out of the different presentations is the questioning of, maybe this is a banal point, but the questioning of uh, dichotomies and boundaries. The first is, of course, that between land and water, which is um, something that the marshes, uh, of course, foreground very much, but also some kind projects of Bonifica. Um, the other one is the, the dichotomy between the metropole and the colony, because, of course, uh, projects of Bonifica were always also projects of settler colonialism that uh, um, invested as much kind of parts of the so-called metropolitan uh, territory of Italy and in particular the southern um, parts of the country as they did uh, overseas colonies and territories. Uh, and in that sense, I think the, the racial dimension of Bonifica uh, is something that's uh, invested also very much the, um, well, for example, the fascist project of uh, forced or so of resettlement in general, uh, in particular in the case of the Pontine Marshes, where you have this kind of um, clear sense of the eugenic nature, or at least uh, this re sort of, um, reframing it as a eugenic kind of project uh, in the late 1930s more explicitly than before. But of course, the eugenic sort of side of this was there even before fascism in a sense. And then this has got to do with the kind of um, uh, the fight against malaria, for example, the kind of consolidation of the Italian nation, the Italian breed. Um, and then I think um, in a sense, although the um, the Bonifica was always a project of ruralization, it was always a project of kind of anti-urbanism. In a sense, kind of this this, this sort of um, fixation on kind of de-urbanizing the dangerous classes um, completely sort of inscribed the Bonifica as a as an urban project, sort of. Um, and, and, and this was also what I was trying to hint at in titling the seminar that we had last semester as the rise and fall of rural urbanism, right? It was an open contradiction that characterized uh, projects of Bonifica that was kind of having a science, an urban science that invested the so-called rural milieu, but a rural milieu that in the history of Italy has always been very much tied to the city even before the contemporary time, the I mean, contemporary period. So, and then finally, um, the, the issue of freedom and unfreedom, I think is something that came up uh, a few times, the idea of kind of, I mean, to what extent were these projects of resettlement really um, uh, about the free mobility or incentivizing people to kind of freely choose to resettle and to what extent they were instead um, a, a, a measure to control social unrest and therefore sort of also compelling people to move. Um, and I think the evidence I have been gathering is also kind of very much going in that direction, both in terms of the control of mobility and more generally of the discipline of labor. So you have this kind of the camp form that you also showed us in your very last uh, slide, Emilio, I mean, points to the problem of, I mean, to what extent is, is, the, is this labor even today free labor? And, uh, um, and to what extent is migration free migration? So um, uh, I think uh, I'll leave it at that. I mean, of course, uh, the haunting, kind of nature of, uh, of Bonifica today is, is very much, I think, uh, apparent from uh, various uh, uh, points you made in, in, uh, in your presentation. I particularly liked your, your notion of entity because I think that's also kind of like a spectral, it has this kind of spectral dimension, like the entity of decolonization, this sort of ghost hovering um, kind of thing. So, 
thank you so much for the very inspiring papers and i wonder if you want to kind of go around uh, the tables if you have any responses direct responses and if not we open to the floor thank you But maybe if I can just say something quick, um, I mean, thank you, um, Irene. Um, I will just maybe stress the aspect of climate, climate change, which is uh, for me the really central to the to the question, right? I mean. Uh, to think of Bonifica as changing the climate, not just, yes, on the one hand, changing the weather, um, the local weather, but also changing the global climate, right? By, as I was saying before, by, by literally emitting an uh, uncountable kind of amounts of carbon, in the, uh, releasing, let's say, not emitting, right? Releasing uncountable amounts of carbon in the atmosphere that had been stored to processes of, of organic decay over centuries. Um, I think that thinking Bonifica as climate change allows us to move, yes, beyond, I think, the kind of very limited temporality of fascism, for example, or even of 20th century modernization, right? And also to see the, the, the globality of something like Bonifica, because in the end, of course, it's not just an Italian history. It's a history that you will find, even though probably in Italy it's particularly um, it's particularly present, but 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 you will find it in other parts of the Mediterranean. I mean, in, even in, in Palestine itself, um, in England, in the Netherlands, right? So, I think it's it's a very real site where to observe how climate change happens because I think it's so easy to think of, so hard to think of climate change as something uh, material, right? It's it's just this big thing of carbon in the atmosphere, and and how does that? How does that happen? How is that carbon released? And it's not just being released today. Uh, the reason why the, the atmosphere is, is eating up is that because it's been released since 200 years, right, more or less. And also, I think the other point is, and here really I have to I have to acknowledge a depth to to recent work that has been done in Black Studies um, to understand how climate change is intertwined with with uh, racial regimes, right, of exploitation, and so. And, and colonization, right? So colonization as climate change. I think there's been really, really amazing work being done in, in environmental, um, connecting the environment, uh, like let's say trying to frame it environmental colonialism, right? I'm thinking about Gaston Hajj. Uh, I'm thinking about um, other uh, like Francois Vergès. Uh, so many scholars now have been, um, have been really trying to, to to, to draw this line, right, between uh, climate change and racialization and, and the exploitation of black bodies, right? And of course, I think that the idea of blackness can be extended, I believe, without, um, let's say, without risking to, of course, undermine or, or, or belittle the suffering of, of black people. But I think it's a, it's a concept as well. It's both, I think, very real suffering of of black people historically but it's also i think a concept that allows us to see processes of racialization more in general right uh, i mean of course the kind of obvious event here would be um uh, the, the the genocide of uh, american indigenous people that caused the atmosphere right transformed literally transformed the atmosphere because caused the atmosphere to cool down because so many trees grew as a result of, of not there being no longer any inhabitants for a couple of centuries, right? Between the arrival of, of, of the European and the, uh, and, and then the late, later settlement that, that the atmosphere like cooled down because so much kind of carbon was captured. And so again, like you see like the racial genocide that is basically something that is directly transforming the atmosphere, right? So, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, I can read why maybe this, of course, the, the passage between the liberal period to the fascist period is gradual, but if you go into sources, I mean, there are two years that are key. So if you read sources from 
1920, 1921, you see how the fascist mentality entered the environment like in one year, two years to the power of landowners or to the change in the administration or the change of the prefecture. So it's very quick, this passage in, inscribed in the landscape and in the power, the people, people with power in the, uh, in the area. But so how the idea of reclamation change, I mean, if we compare like the law, uh, the 1882 law, that is the, like the main liberal law on reclamation, and the, and the um, the law about the in, integral reclamation uh, issued in 1928. Before the fascist regime, uh, reclamation was a technical issue, was an agrarian issue, and was a hygienic issue. With the fascist regime, okay, those issues remained, but the passage is that reclamation become a demographic and a political project. So. The role of uh, displacement, the role of creating new communities, the role of removing conflict is and create consensus through the uh, reclamation project. It's key to understand what happened during the fascist regime. And again, if we go to sources, we see that in two or three years, all the conflicts that that um, featured the Pontine marshes as a really lively place disappeared. So all these administrative conflicts just didn't have any more space during the fascist regime. So we don't find any conflict in fascist sources uh, from 1928. Of course, there is a passage, um, associations try to uh, fight back, but there was no space. And if we think Bonifica is a place uh, as, a as a negotiation between different management projects, then the fascist reclamation maybe is not a reclamation. It's just an imposition, a, a top-down transformation. So this was the idea of questioning the idea of reclamation in, during the fascist period. And also another uh, break is the, um, uh, the, the what you mentioned that Irene saw, the mobility is key. And the idea of creating uh, like spaces where people do not move is key during the fascist regime. So the new towns, where uh, this is uh, this is true both for the the, uh, the domestic uh, colonization through reclamation, but also in the colonial space, uh, uh, like put people in a place and don't allow them to move is uh, is part of the project. And if we go back to the liberal period, mobility, circular mobility patterns were key to live together with the with the with with wetlands because there are cycles, ecological cycles that. Uh, aligned with uh, demographic and migration cycles. And this was break during the fascist regime. Uh, and this also connected the idea that you can change nature without any limits. While all the reclamation projects um, produced and uh, conceived during the liberal period, they wanted to live together with the marshland. So they wanted to restrict the area or the flooded areas, but there was no idea of removing completely uh, wetlands. So wetlands, and forest could be still part and parcel of the landscape. When the fascist regime uh, redesigned the Pontine Marshes, there was no more space for uh, flooded area or for uh, and for forests. So they created the national park, the Shircea National Park, but was just the recreation of a small portion of the uh, previous forest. And also, of course, the change in technology available was uh, was key in the 30s. So. The introduction of the, um, the drainage pumps were, were, of course, they were available in the in the late uh, nine, I think uh, in the late nineteenth uh, century, but they were introduced during World War One, and thanks to the legislation uh, during World War One, they were they became more and more um, present in the Pontine marshes, and of course, then there is also the uh, investment coming from. Uh, um, entrepreneurs not belonging to the territory. So a lot of changes uh, happened before the fascist regime. And the other, uh, the last point I want uh, to maybe uh, to put on the table is that maybe we also this break between dichotomy between the rural space and the urban space. If we think about, if we think of land as a tool to have political power, to do to have administrative role, and also, to, I mean, it was also a source of wealth during the uh, contemporary Italy, Maybe there is no real dichotomy. So privatizing the uh, marshes is also a way to acquire power in cities. And I think this was very clear also in, in, in when you show the flow of capitals and the different way of 
transforming resources from the countryside into more urban way of showcasing power. Yeah, I'm just gonna uh, add a comment to uh, uh, what Irene mentioned before in terms of fascism, ex exceptionalism. Um, I think from an anthropologist and a Latinense point of view, uh, the way to understand how, why there is this attachment to fascism uh, in contemporary politics and its exceptionalism, the state of exceptionalism is by understanding how its exceptionalism reverberates in people's lives and understanding how it still um, it's performed and, and emerges in people's everyday life. And this is because there are communities like Latina who like people who live in Latina who found themselves having to deal with it without necessarily uh, looking for it. They sort of, you know, we happen to be born there. Um, and, and that's why I was actually, uh, I was fascinated by Emilio's presentation on, on you know, how we re-engage with this uh, buildings and spaces, because it's a question that it's very much alive in Latina. And there is, also, there is this sort of silencing, you know, even with something as blatant as an, an M-shaped building, we call it Palazzo M, and that's it. You know, this truncated name that it's there, but it also isn't, right? Um, and I think that what, what looking at people's everyday lives um, helps us to do is to understand fascism as multiple, as something that exists in many different forms. Um, while I think a lot of times is presented as one single entity, you know? And I think that's where then these everyday experiences sort of don't emerge and we miss maybe how that exceptionalism um, is created. Well, actually, there's a lot. Um, it was indeed very kind of, uh, I mean, your, your intervention comment and all your five years so much inspiring. Just wanted to pick on on a couple of, of things, and which are somehow I, I hope it can bridge between this this idea of fascism, Italian fascism, as ex exceptional, but also related to the question of what is it as climate change as you were offering. We can actually find a much more open space and field that allow us uh, to understand the. Uh, this uh, uh, phenomena as a, or a practice or ideology or vision, like in a very kind of polymorphous manifestation. If we think about also, you, you, you were mentioning in, in your slides, you, you brought up uh, um, the images from Libya. And uh, um, we also know that uh, um, the famous claim, famous slogan that became more popular in the colonization of Palestine, which is uh, making the desert bloom, it's also very much derived by the transformation and an attempted, you know, transformation of the desert in some sort of arable land. So this is not to say that we need to kind of um, universalize categories because every context also needs to be kind of understood, studied, analyzed, and also in terms of struggles, then you understand what, what each context requires in order to address the issue. But it also kind of, uh, um, takes me back, back to the old lesson of the black radical tradition that was made already in the early in the, in the mid thirties, when uh, you had uh, C.L.R. James, Du Bois, um, Oliver Cox, George Padmore, that were already kind of theorizing and not just a theorizing, but making as a fact that fascism could not be detached from the long history of Western civilization in relation to liberal colonialism. So this is like, a, a, for me, is this a kind of a pillar from where to start somehow in order to understand the ramification and what is the seed of modern culture, modernity and modernism as a way of life and a, as a way of transformation. So this is like, again, like I want to stress the importance of trying to understand 
uh, uh, to, to connect analysis and connect the struggles and connect uh, sensitivities and lived experience, also as a way to, to, to again, kind of uh, um, go back to the, to the question of reconnection. So we all know that imperialism, colonialism, fascism operate uh, as a global project, global imperial capitalist project, uh, as a way to disconnect places. So the reconnection would be very much a sort of uh, um, issues that I would put on the top of, of, of the agenda, also as a way to, I can, to coordinate and understand different scholarship, you know, how they can talk to each other and also to think together uh, on how, you know, hypothetical reuse of these spaces or is also, also renaming things, no? Um, the other thing, it's, it's also in, in relation to, 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 to your comment and, and, and the, the, the point, the good point that you made about uh, this uh, uh, attempt to, of fascism, historic Italian fascism, to be an anti-urban um, uh, movement. And which is again, and, and, and the way it was kind of like, you know, kind of to, to intersect the class struggle and crush it from the very beginning through this process of resettlement and forced mobility. Uh, it was again a way to kind of reiterate the modern trope of separation and dichotomies of the urban versus the rural, which is like, if we then read it like in, a, in its manifestation, it's a series of dichotomies that are racialized, that are classed, that are gendered, that are sexualized in many, in many ways. And to see again, like this, uh, this again, like I could, I, I'm not able yet to elaborate more on the last picture that I, that I should, because it was just at the beginning of, of, a, of a snapshot of an instant of, of something that you see the attempt of not just to control mobility and you say control labor. And this is like the very much important thing, but also to understand that this is so-called first uh, informal uh, um, shacks or settlements that uh, a seasonal migrant worker arrange and the, the response from the municipality and the unions was to kind of create a sort of uh, like fenced village is also a way to reiterate for me in my eyes, the separation between the rural and the urban because most of these uh, uh, migrants also for what I understood from the unions were also kind of not able to reach the city. So the city is still kind of kept aside. And this is a sort of like, in, 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 in my view, like a, a way, you know, these continuities, these kind of legacies are very much kind of reiterated and this tension between urban and rural keeps on going very strongly. Um. Yeah, this was um, this was amazing. Thank you all for your present. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentations and for the for the responses. Uh, so much to uh, continue to talk about. Before um, going any further, I was wondering if there's any question comments from the audience. Yes, I'll come around. Um, I I, uh, I I want to uh, thank the, the panel. We we were invite, invited to come along. I'm an architect. I've been involved in teaching and over many years, um, and I got to say that I how much I admire uh, the tremendously difficult research that you're doing that involves juggling so many economic political, uh, environmental kind of issues and trying to weave some kind of truth out of uh, specific situations that you've studied. It's, it's, uh, it's inspiring. And I think it's important that, it, that it's taking place here in an architectural program. But um, I am an architect and uh, of a very earlier generation than the people in this room who are architecture students or architects. Um, and uh, I got to say that I was, uh, I, I um, really grew up as an architect in a time when architecture was regarded really as an autonomous discipline and that it had its own rules, its own jargon, its own kind of uh, way of thinking about making place and making buildings. And I think beyond just simply uh, 
the charge that uh, it was purely a formalistic kind of exercise that we were involved back in those days in the 70s and 60s, 70s, and so on. And I think it was absolutely right that uh, our field turned its back uh, to some degree and to an increasingly greater degree on that very limited way of thinking about architecture as an autonomous thing and really looking to see how as a specific field with narrow interests, it might uh, become more relevant to ordinary people and, and to societies and to communities. And that I guess has grown uh, stronger and stronger in our field, both not just in teaching and research, but also I think in practice uh, to the point where it's just, one cannot really imagine being a teacher, I think, in architecture school, um, or certainly a practitioner or the leader of a firm in architecture, if sustainability uh, and the ethics that surround that are not absolute paramount. And so um, I guess what I wanted to, I'm fascinated that there is, there are, nobody with an architectural training sitting here. And um, I guess I'm gonna ask you an almost impossible question. It, it, it really um, has to do with my judgment now as a pretty old guy uh, that um, this continuous 25, maybe 20 year effort to really kind of turn our gaze uh, outwards from our own concerns as architects you know, to a much broader, more complex field. And with particular emphasis on sustainability and I it, it, it fascinated to hear you mention climate change as being a, maybe the overarching thing or almost any kind of discussion like this. And to ask, uh, but but now as an old guy, I think that somehow uh, what um, has been a tremendous effort within our discipline um, and in practice to bring these issues to bear uh, in a system where obviously it's. You know, capitalism reigns, and you know, money. Money is, in fact, the still the gold star of the realm of what architects do. There's a client and all that stuff. You know that we still have to be responsible to. We're trying somehow to uphold these ethical um, values that were behind sustainability. It's all being done in the context now of a climate crisis is becoming enormously uh, overarching to the degree to be almost suffocating. And I just wonder uh, whether the kind of optimism that is for me is behind um, architects willingness to sort of take up the very difficult kind of ethical issues behind sustainability within the context of a world where, you know, a product, delivering a product for the least price and so on is a thing which governs. Uh, whether that is in fact, when you think about what's being said by the UN and so on and so on, about the intensity of the crisis, of the climate crisis, whether that isn't in fact um, way over optimistic, are we, are we naive optimists in our field that we should be sort of pushing in that direction? Now, this is a totally unfair question for this panel. As I say, you know, I'm babbling away about architecture here and what architects do and so on and trying to get some sort of clarity into all this. But I, what I uh, wanted to ask you, has anything come out of the specific research that each of you have been doing that um, gives you I mean, I just ask you straight, you know, do you think that we are 
stupid optimists um, is the equivalent of fascism today, which I see you know, being the American, you know, back home and so on, what we're seeing from the extreme right as being sort of hovering there along with the climate crisis. Uh, just as people thought about fascism, I suppose that, uh, um, you know, when I was a young kid growing up at the war time. Um, is there anything that came out of your research that says, yes, carry on being optimistic, carry on doing that because it's worthwhile or not? Is this a silly question? I don't know. Is this uh, an unfair question? I don't know. But I'm just kind of trying to sort of connect what architects are and what they do to what you can do. Sorry for such a long No, that was great. Do you, anybody <laughs> wants to take that? <laughs> are we stupid optimists? Well, maybe the research that is being carried out now about the uh, like assessment of reclamation projects is i think is a is a new way to look at transformation of the environment and to try to not uh like engage in a fight against the environment so there are, we are now i think reassessing that reclamation is not a positive uh transformation i think this is quite uh, linked to the climate crisis and how we can value uh, wetland, for example, this started in the 1970s, but I mean, it's now it's emerging also in research. And uh, in Italy, there are a lot of projects conducted by university, universities and institutions like regions uh, to uh, use wetlands as a way to tackle climate change or to build more resilient landscapes. In terms of urban planning, now there's a lot. Uh, there's a I mean, there are projects that are claiming for uh, the value of less uh, wetlands instead of uh, the reclamation. So this, I think this is a way to be uh, optimistic in a sense we, we are starting living again, respecting the ecosystem cycle. I don't know if I reply to your question, maybe more from a perspective of the urban planning than from the architects. Maybe, maybe. No, I can build on what Roberta just said because I do have some architecture training and even I uh, part of the no 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 it's fine I, I try to I try to hide it so <laughs> yeah also because the, the architecture register in Italy is, is dreadful and they keep sucking money out of you so I anyways um, I have my stamp no I mean the only maybe based on what you said um, in the region of uh, the former lake uh, of Cucino, the one I was uh, talking about in the first part of my of my presentation, the, uh, there are people that in the last couple of years have been discussing about reflooding the lake, reflooding parts of it, because um, because they are realizing, and I think it's not framed as a particularly radical um, proposal. It's just local people that realize that the problems that they have of aridity or extreme temperatures are only going to get worse and worse in the next uh, decade. And so that's, you know, what would happen if you know we reflood a little bit of it? And for me, that's, that's it, right? I think uh, it should be even much more radical than just uh, re-appreciating the wetlands. Uh, let's reflood the, the whole thing, not even just a bit, you know? So I would like as an architect, you know, now after having done all this research, I would like to really think and you know if, if i have a, at some point the chance to teach an architecture studio i will probably bring my students there and try to you know what would it mean to actually reflood the entire valley and uh, you know how can we plan this process or like how, how can we actually make it work yeah and i also feel like your impossible question was also to all our students that um where asked to do a design project into well, all of our students, well, the students that remained, <laughs> but the students that uh, throughout the semester, we've been asked them to, um, in a sense, engage with sites that had this sort of really long history of bonifica and uh, intervene or start thinking about practices of intervention uh, that perhaps don't replicate old patterns of bonifica itself. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's a really um, interesting point. Um, 
on from my perspective, I love the fact that maybe the word architecture somehow escaped the entire conference or the entire <laughs> symposium. I, and at the same time was absolutely present. Uh, the idea that like uh, perhaps uh, the way that Emilio put it in a kind of pedagogical perspective, the idea of sort of creating a series of disconnections, disconnect a, cer a certain kind of lineage uh, or a certain narrative and then reconnecting it uh, as a way of sort of thinking about coexisting on the territory in different ways. Uh, uh, that's perhaps the, uh, the way that I can see myself as an educator, as an, as an architect, uh, as a way of somewhat maybe optimistically moving forward. Um, but I'm curious to know if there is any students that want to make, okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, I just thought like an interesting, like Eastern example of what's going on right now with maybe some idea of the Bonifico, which would be like the Chernobyl meltdown, just because I feel like when the Soviets chose Pripyat or Chernobyl's location for their major power source of the Soviet Union, um, it was kind of this idea where they came in to natural landscape quickly, um, I guess, like created an infrastructure around that. And then after post-disaster and the liquidation period um, in the various 30 years it's been since the disaster, people have been able to actually move back into the zone because radiation has left. And obviously with the conflict now between Russia and Ukraine, the process is kind of in the air, but it just, I thought it would have been interesting to see like the architectural interventions over the like next coming years of what would have happened there just because it was almost like there was some form of a bona fica when they created the power plant. Then through human intervention, there was a disaster and the land was reclaimed by nature, and then we moved back in there. So it was almost like, we're just in a 30 year period, it was like a full cycle of what was possible. And um, yeah, I don't know. I just, just this whole conversation made me think about that. But yeah. Okay, um, thank you so much for these presentations. And I want to just ask um, generally, although I think maybe especially Emilio and Irene and um, Elena talked more explicitly about this notion of afterlives. And it's a term that I've used, Elena and I were talking about this at one of the breaks, that I've used it kind of without interrogating it. And since there was a lot of you know careful reading of terms like reclamation and so on, I'm sort of wondering about the utility of the notion of afterlives um, for some of these cases, because it implies that, right, that, that there was this thing and now essentially there's an afterlife and especially for a place like Latina, maybe it's different when you have like a, a Borgo Fascista in Sicily that's completely abandoned um, and in ruins. But I just wonder, and Elena, maybe you and, and maybe the two of you chose that, but I'd like to hear more because it's something I'm thinking about, like whether I'm going to use that term in the future, because it carries with it, like from an anthropological point of view, it has this notion that something's a survival, right? That it has <coughs> its original meaning is gone. And now it's this kind of strange anachronism in the present world. But in many of these cases, you know, people are living in these spaces, negotiating with them. So I don't think that necessarily they would think of themselves as living in a space of an afterlife. I, I don't know. It's a question for all of you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, of course, I, as I said in the beginning, I came to think in these terms by kind of doing sort of sheer kind of contemporary anthropological work with you know migrants today and then kind of realizing kind of how the rabble in the in the landscape sort of can tell a more complex story or kind of allow us better understanding of, of how these processes of 
uh, isolation, uh, containment and extraction kind of have come to materialize in the way they have. Um, and in, in kind of digging through archives and histories, I think uh, it became increasingly clear for me how um, in the, the, the project of reclamation, the project of uh, redemption, the project of rural urbanism <laughs> was uh, terminated, it was truncated um, with the agrarian reform in Italy in particular. So the, the idea of, of in this kind of um, idealization of rural life and the countryside and, and the kind of prominent role that agriculture was thought to have for the building of the nation and the upkeep of the nation was totally um, erased. And even actually, so already I think that the agrarian reform in this country was an afterlife of projects of Bonifica in the sense that it was, I mean, according to historians' readings, a way to kind of quell the unrest that had kind of resurfaced after the end of the war and the demise of uh, fascism um, at a time when, on the other hand, the um, orientation, the political economic orientation was totally flattened upon industrialization and urbanism flat. So, um, so the, the, there was, I mean, what Pasolini called an anthropological revolution in the sense of like, you know, a complete sort of dismissal of um, rural uh, culture and peasant culture and, uh, and a total kind of embracing of consumer urban consumer culture. So in that sense, I think the term afterlife sort of really kind of uh, helps to evoke this process in a way, because then, of course, then you have, but it, the, there is this underlying uh, sort of ideas about, you know, kind of purity and uh, that, that keep kind of surfacing, you know, and, and the kind of racialized sort of premises of, of, of this idea of purity engendered, of course. Uh, and th therefore colonial um, before they are fascist. The, the, that's very clearly still there, but the, the rural ruralist part is totally gone. And it was gone already for the, uh, during the agrarian reform, I think. I don't know if some... I think, um, also from my perspective, um, the question of afterlife is again a kind of uh, resonates this 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 kind of battlefield around designations and and naming and 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 the issue of of, of language and and um, how we we call things how we and, and it's also an attempt to try to find to struggle to find your words the best words or the words that somehow serve like the possibility to reorient narratives so if i think about a life that is uh, defined by certain narratives that i checked or kind of controlled by again the so-called expertise technical knowledge um, um, state narrative that defined certain event in a certain history, the afterlife helped me to, to find other ways afterwards. In that sense, like also kind of very theoretically, and uh, it, it, it helps me also to relate it with the, with the coloniality, modernity, um, you know, pattern somehow, because it, it kind of uh, um, suggests me that we can find and name things after the event that had created certain things, certain phenomena, and certain practice. You know, the, there is something once the historical phenomenon ends that continues. So the idea of the afterlife is again a, is a, is a matter of juggling a little bit. It's it's a, that's why I'm, I I look at it as a, as a battlefield because it's not a fixed terminology, it's not a fixed definition, but it opens the space 
to kind of uh, intervene, uh, creating new uh, narratives and also working on the vocabulary no? that we are, I think this came out very much also throughout the, the, the presentation, like from, you know, Bonifica's climate change and other ways to address it or architecture, no? how we how we call like my, my <laughs> internal, like personal struggle with editors that refuse to, you know, to acknowledge the fact that things can be named otherwise. This, in that sense, afterlife evokes like a, a variety of options that at least kind of liberate language and make it more horizontal in that sense. Just add a very quick comment to that. Um, when we were talking about it outside, uh, and I do recognize as well, though, that probably, and I realized this while we were talking, that my interlocutors would probably not like the use of the word afterlife because it ties them back into something that they're trying to escape from and to not be defined by. So, um, I guess for me at least, it will. This conversation will mean that I will go and rethink the way I talk about what now I refer to as the afterlife of Latina. Great. Is there any other comment before? Yes. Generally, before this um, symposium, I was completely unfamiliar with the idea of Guanapica, so it was really um, elucidating to be here, but it, it kind of reminded me of the process that um, Germany went through in the 90s in reclaiming, whereas they had to go back into Berlin and reclaim, you know, not only Nazi properties, but imperial properties as well, and dealing with those connotations. So looking specifically at the building in Latina, the M building, as well as the communities in Sicily, it seems the M building still holds a significant position in the community and serves much of a purpose. While a few of the smaller communities in Sicily were just completely abandoned. So how do you deal with the reclamation there? And what are the perceptions of the locals in terms of those buildings that they're interrelated with? Yeah, so in Latina is very much still present and actually the entire city is, I mean, I only showed one snapshot, but the entire city was built as a representation of fascist power. So there's much symbolism in the architecture, but also in actual symbols that exist still in the city. And while some of it was chiseled out from the buildings really to get rid or, you know, erase that past, it would have meant to uh, destroy the entire uh, city, which obviously uh, was not possible. And the way it's dealt with in the city is very much of a, the same way that it's dealt with with the name. So it's very much of a conscious, unconscious relationship with the building. So everyone knows, but no one speaks about it in quite a open way. And I was, I was talking with Emilio before, I was saying that um, my initial project was to be uh, looking at fascist buildings and how they're exactly this, how people relate with them to them and how, you know, what their presence and use is in contemporary Latina. And people were not interested in talking about that. They were very, uh, you know, the response was just like, I'm not interested in this. I, I don't care whether that am, whatever that is. It's there, I'm used to it. I walk past it every day and that's about it. That's as much as my relationship with it goes. So I guess that um, there isn't a lot of, um, or maybe it is a conscious relationship with it, but there isn't a lot of acknowledgement of that. There aren't any plaques in Latina to tell you what buildings are when they were built. Um, it's sort of this always moving between this absent presence. Yeah. I when we started 
uh, our conversation, our gathering on the carpets and the, and the, and the, and the furniture to arrange by the community, there was a lot of silence at the beginning. Um, we were coming, you know, um, students, international students, academics, artists, with the idea, you know, we would like to tackle the question of fascism. <laughs> when we arrive there, we say, all right, so we need to learn how to reframe, you know, the terms of the conversation. Because uh, the, the, the memories of fascism were, were also very short, like we're talking about a time frame that is very limited compared to the others that also you have, have, have explained and have illustrated. But it kind of connects, and, and I, I think I, I didn't, I just briefly mentioned before in the presentation, with other experience of trauma that the community is going through, intergenerational. So then you have like the transformation, the agrarian reform, you have depopulation, you have my outward migration, you have new waves and flows of migration that comes from the ex-colonial world, colonized world. And then you have also very kind of local issues like in earthquakes, for example, that hit the village in the 90s, that kind of also erase, try to imagine a massive earthquake that the takes off all the paraphernalia maybe, or the memories of the grandfathers and grandmothers that were living before. So it, it is very, very complicated in that sense. But uh, I think uh, there is a, th that's again like what, what I was trying to say that kind of, kind of tracing a temporal perimeter around the architecture would be um, a massive mistake in, in the sense if we want to move forward and to how to understand how to create new communities that comes with very different backgrounds, but at the same time can, can elaborate forms of, uh, this is like, I am really get the help of, I don't know, uh, Edouard Glissant, the idea of relation, for example, and, and to think how heritage can become relational in that sense. But kind of community work is the base of, uh, of negotiating, renegotiating, and also translation. Because uh, uh, going back to the, to the experiment, the idea of bringing the carpets and mixing it with their stuff, we translate different forms of hospitality, no? that, make, that suddenly at some point, hopefully, it makes sense to the people that are participating. But it, it's a way forward to think, you know, to understand fascism as an historical event, but at the same time, like who's using architecture, land, space, like through its kind of very much scattered ramification that takes us like in unexplored fields. But this would be for me like uh, the way, the, the challenge for, for heritage making. Maybe if I can add one thing is that um, something I found, let's say in my field work both in Veneto and in uh, Sardinia, is that so the, the architecture of Unifica might be abandoned, for example, as was in the case in Sicily or not, as in the case of Latina, right? So there are like multiple directions in which, in which it went, but there's something else that remains, right? Even when the architecture is completely abandoned or failed or, or uh, so on, which is of course the kind of uh, system of power that Bonifica has created uh, because uh, I realized in the conversations with people like fishermen, for example, that actually the real problem was the consortia di Bonifica. So we think that these are fascist institu institutions. So the consortium is essentially just a consortium that manages the water in an area that has been reclaimed. And it was instituted uh, in the process of Bonifica, usually by the fascist regime, but also not. But it's still there. And, and uh, even though maybe, again, no one thinks about Bonifica anymore, now the, the, the organization is there and the way it works very simply is that the farmers pay and they get water in return. So it's essentially it's funded by the landowners and it makes the interests of the landowners and it distributes the water according to the landowners. And of course, this is a huge position of power to occupy yeah? because you effectively control the entire water flow water on a very huge uh, landscape, a very large landscape. Uh, how do you work with that, you know, because of course they, they privilege the interests of farmers, of intensive capitalist farmers, as opposed to the interests, for example, of fishermen or other people who might want the water to do other things. You know, what if I want to reflow the part of it, you know, for sure the farmers will be against it and they have the consortium on their side. And the consortium is even weird because it's not even public and it's not even private, you know, it's something in between. It's very hard to control, it's very opaque. 
So how do you work with such a like ingrained, like literally like embedded in the landscape, a structure of power that is embedded in the landscape? Or how do you, these are often questions that I don't have an answer with, but I would be very much keen to kind of spend more time in these in this sites, you know, and work with, with people like fishermen who are there and they tell me, uh, you know, sometimes the consortio uses the weights for, for, a, for a big uh, thunderstorm to release all of the dirty waters from their fields because then they will not be detected when it's full of pollutants. And so then they are at the end of it, at the receiving end of it, and they get all of the, in, where they fish, it, all of a sudden they get all of these uh, uh, toxic uh, substances that are used as fertilizers. So like, it, it's a huge conflict, but it is happening kind of under underground, right? Well, I'm, you, one more question. Okay, one last one, then we go. Sorry, Sorry. Um, um, there's a lot to unpack, but we don't have time. Um, I think, uh, thanks, uh, Daniele, to, and thanks to all of you to bring such an incredible discussion uh, that is lacking in an architectural discourse, I think. And as an architect, I'll try to um, bring up uh, uh, probably there is uh, a sort of a connection among all of the um, presentation that you've had um, that is probably through an archetype, which I, it, it's of course a provocation, but the square as an archetype would be an interesting um, an interesting archetype to, to discuss um, the, the its political significance through starting from the Carden de Cumano, the Centuratio, which was the first uh, colonization made by Romans through the fascist uh, regime, which you started before saying that the square was the moment in which the first like land survey was placed in Latina. And it's Actually, I, I'll, I'll suggest maybe to the students, because we've had some conversation about it um, last time, um, that there is actually a role um, of, of the architect behind this thing, behind, behind this social phenomena. And um, maybe also, but also like in the Piana di Firenze, in near Prato, the, Go the Gore were one of the most important infrastructural uh, projects that has been done by the Medici family to reclaim the land. And um, uh, also, this was just like a moment of um, auto-referential. Uh, but then uh, the, the Fucino, uh, I was really interested in the Fucino in the Fucino um, phenomenon of land reclamation, also in connection to the, um, to the uh, territory that the students are studying, which is the Ente Maremma. And um, the Ente Maremma Fucino was, um, was the whole uh, organization, governmental organization that uh, managed the, um, so uh, it's, it's a really interesting social phenomenon, of, of, of course, of exodus, because so all of the, uh, the, the the citizens from the Fucino uh, in the 1953 moved to Capalbio and to the uh, Bonifica Maremana to work on the, to finish the work on the Bonifica, which is really interested. And still the architectural archetype that has been used was the square, was the Cardo and the Cumano. And um, I think there is a sort of, um, yeah, an interesting discussion could emerge if we only could grasp um, what are the forms, the, the architectural elements and the role of the architects behind this thing. Because of course, there is no solution, in my opinion. I mean, the architecture is not the, the solution, but it could be, um, um, it could be a, a discipline that could let some contradiction emerge um, within this social phenomena. Um, okay, sorry, there's lots of unpack. It could be really longer than this, but we don't have time. But thanks. That's great. Um, I think we're, we went already a little bit over time, and uh, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, especially also students are.
nagging. <laughs> um, but again, I wanted to thank everybody for um, wonderful presentations and leaving us with lots of thoughts for the remaining semesters, uh, a few weeks of the semester. And I wish we could share with you the work that we attempted in the uh, Marimma Grossetana um, and uh, to get some feedback on that as well. But for now, uh, thank you again, and uh, hope to continue the conversation uh, over some Prosecco outside. Thank you. Great.